So I'm Carrie Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, and I am co-chair with Lori of this um, council. And I, I'm glad you all came. Thank you so much for coming today. And I wanted to call your attention, in case you haven't noticed, <laughs> the camera is recording our meeting today. And you're from Orca, right? Yeah. Yes. It's yes. So. Jerome, right? My name is Jerome, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. We're glad you're here, too. Welcome, Jerome. <laughs> You can also help yourself to some food. Yeah, too. There's please. plenty of it. Oh, well, thank you. But maybe later, after I'm filming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a deal. Okay. Um, my name is Valerie Nickel. I'm a human resources manager. I work for the Department of Human Resources. I guess I'm an ad hoc member <laughs> of the council. <laughs> you're, sorry. you're chewing. Sorry. Caught you. I'm sorry. My name is Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of uh, Justice for All, a uh, racial justice organization that started uh, about four years ago in Central Vermont. Thanks for having me. Thank you. My name is Brad Fell. I'm the uh, deputy secretary of administration. Uh, the, uh, the secretary um, would would have been here today, but she has an appointment that she could not get out of. And uh, so anyway, I, I'm here to attend on her behalf and to and to sit in and, and, and listen to to what you guys have going on and to the degree that I can contribute. And um, and also, I think Tom and I can at least give you an update on where we are in the uh, diversity panel and the executive director process and, uh, and, and how that's going. Wonderful, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. You picked the perfect time yeah. and, and Good. To, to do so. Good. Hi, I'm Bill Myers. I'm a talent acquisition consultant uh, with the State of Vermont Department of Human Resources. Um, I'm, like Valerie, an uh, ad hoc member of this committee. Uh, I also chair the Disability Employment Working Group, which is kind of a sub of this, and uh, partnering with um, usually like Hugh Bradshaw and Diane Del Moss, who aren't here, but uh, you know, doing a lot of work with helping bring more awareness to people with disabilities and opportunities within the state, not just outside the other companies in Vermont. Hi, I'm Aditi Lagu. I'm a labor relations manager with the Department of Human Resources. Uh, for a few months last year, I was actually the DHR designee on the council, and now I'm an ad hoc member too. And I'm Joan Osbaum. I'm the director of Vermont's Adult Protective Services, which is the primary state component responsible for investigating allegations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of vulnerable adults. But I was actually appointed to this council uh, sort of as an at-large member as well, uh, representing the LGBT community. I'm Karen Richards. I am um, on the equity advisor, or the, what is it, the racial advisory panel, um, and uh, recently retired from state government. But still a member of the council. But still, yes, an appointed <laughs> member of the council. But no longer representing the HRC. Correct. But, um, but you're the HRC's designee on the panel. So you're here wearing two hats, right? Well, not but not the HRC. The, the appointment was personal, so I'm not really representing the HRC. Okay. It was a personal appointment. On the racial and equity? No, on this. To this right, panel. on this oh, one yeah. for yeah. sure, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But the HRC appointed you to the racial equity. Yes. yes, the HRC appointed me to the racial equity. Yes. yes. <clears throat> so thank you for coming and wearing all your hats. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm Lori Valburn. Um, I head up the Civil Rights Division at the Vermont Agency of Transportation. I am happy to co chair the council along with Carrie. And with Diane uh, not being with us today, at least not yet. I think I have a distinction of uh, we surviving um, and outliving um, most of the other council members. So this will be my 16th or 17th year on the council. Outliving figuratively, not really. I hope. Well, we don't know. We don't know. Okay. People aren't here, so we have to know. All right, hopefully it's just figuratively. So happy to be here. And my name is Rachel Allen. I am the DHR designee. And uh, I'm Tom Waldman, the general counsel of the Department of Human Resources. Um, until Rachel became the commissioner's designee, Rachel's a staff attorney in the legal division, uh, I was the commissioner's designee for the better part of last year. 
Well, wonderful. So we have a lot of uh, folks who are here in a variety of capacities and several ad hoc members from Department of Human Resources whose participation is critical to the council's ability to collect information and data and uh, be able to hopefully move forward. Um, we are definitely missing several members of the council that are usually present for um, our meetings, especially for the annual retreat. Um, but hopefully some of them will be joining us um, over the course of the next few hours. And so glad again, um, Deputy Secretary, for, do you prefer Brad or Deputy Secretary Furlan? Brad is perfect. All right, thank you. So again, um, this is the perfect meeting for you to be attending to learn more about the council and our work, but also to help inform our next steps since the annual retreat is our opportunity to uh, recap the work of the council over the past year, as well as to do our goal setting and planning for the uh, upcoming year. And since we are an advisory council, uh, we're always seeking input from the administration how we can best meet um, all of the administration's strategic goals and objectives in the area of workforce, uh, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. so, so we um, have an agenda, and hopefully you all have seen it, and there's a, there are paper copies up there if you need one, and we had um, we did not include time to talk with a representative from the administration because we didn't know that you were going to be here until after we'd already sent out the agenda. So my question is, where should we put that in? Should we start with that? Should we start with summarizing our work? What do you think? Would it be more helpful for us to give you an idea of what we've been working on um, within that we've had input from the commissioner as well as other representatives from DHR? And, and then you can weigh in on some of your ideas, or would you prefer to share with us? No, I think it would be, I, I am, you know, one of the benefits of, um, I've been in state government for almost 30 years, just shy of 30 years, it'll be 30 years in May. So I've held a few different positions, and, um, and this position here has been considerably different than any position I've had before in state government. And so I get to sit in on, on, on panels like this or in other areas of government that I've never really been exposed to. So. So, other than you know being here and, and you know speaking on behalf of the uh, of the administration and saying we greatly support you know the work that you do and we'll do anything to support you moving forward, I'm also here for personal reason to learn as much as I can about what you guys do and if I can contribute that that would be great. So um, so I don't mind sitting back and listening in. Uh, if you have specific questions for me, then I'm willing to you know take a shot at them. And if not, then I know Tom. Is, is right there to, to, to you know, uh, probably jump in as well too, but um, I, I'm i here to sit back and just participate to the degree that I can. So. That sounds great. Okay. okay, so I have a suggestion. Okay. Why don't we start off uh, with our number two on our agenda, reports from the subcommittees and kind of update what we've been working on and where we are, and that will help you kind of know. Um, and then with our section three, where we're talking about 2019 goals and objectives, maybe we start with the racial equity advisory panel topic, and then through that we can also talk about anything broader that the administration has in mind or that we want to say to the administration. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so it was exactly a year ago at our last annual retreat that we um, decided to, we, we made a, a conscious effort to uh, come up with several different uh, subcommittees who would be focused on different um, areas that we identified uh, we wanted to put particular focus on. And the council as a group has held uh, four plenary meetings this year, but the subcommittees have continued to meet um, usually on a monthly basis um, and report out at our quarterly meetings. and. I don't want to mess up uh, what the three different committees are. I know that I'm on the training committee along with Joe and with Karen and Adite, so we have good representation here. Yeah. Um, and I believe we have representation from a couple of the other committees as well. Carrie, are you I'm the committee? data, I'm on the data one and 
So Valerie's Valerie. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Great is covered. Mm-hmm. Um, is the other group like recruitment retention and yeah. And Bill, you would be very well equipped to cover that one mm-hmm. and to fill us in on the work of that group. And there's certainly a lot to report out on the work of the recruitment division these days. Yes. It's a happen in place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so where would we like to start um, as far as the different committees? Since, as you can tell, none of this is rehearsed or orchestrated. <laughs> and we are, we're gonna sort of jump in. Joe, yeah, you I'm wanna Yeah, I'm gonna talk about training a little bit. There's not a, yep. I don't, there's really nothing concrete since the last one we met because we had one meeting in between and it got canceled. Um, but uh, I can sort of give an end of the year recap of, of where we are. We really uh, landed on uh, uh, three big initiatives. One was, um, which I think we have had the most advancement in, was reviewing the sexual harassment training that was uh, made mandatory for all state employees. And there was a, a committee of us that uh, all attended at the same time or had, I think, at DTA, you were at a separate time, right? And, uh, and we met afterwards just to sort of do a, uh, a post-op uh, review of it. And from our perspective, wearing our hats from this council, uh, how we thought it was received. And we had uh, some substantial feedback that we, uh, we wanted to give to CAPS around um, uh, making it more pertinent towards, it is very focused on, from our perspective, sort of a liability and, and doing things to um, avoid liability to the state, which were important components, but it's sort of, we felt it lost a little bit of the forest for the trees in terms of how do you engage in the system, um, what resources are available to you, and emphasizing that. And, uh, and so, um, Laura, you and Karen. Karen, was it just the two of you, by the way? Yeah, we ended up meeting with uh, Carrie Miner, who heads up CAPS, and uh, Brian Rimmer, who mm-hmm. is the supervisor of the training group. And we were able to share the recommendations and, and comments and observations. And actually, that's been moving forward nicely. Um, all of our ideas were pretty well received and um, have been incorporated into a very revised version of the training that's being rolled out for all new employees to state government. Um, that's a pilot program that's just launching this month and will continue into 2019 mm-hmm. as part of the administration's uh, There's a statewide task force on new employee onboarding, um, and it was decided that um, there was a lot of training that we wanted to make available to all new employees in the state government, but in particular, some of that could be delivered through online training, but uh, four hours of training would be delivered in person, and that consists of two hours of Sex, pre- preventing and addressing um, sexual harassment, as well as um, unconscious bias and workplace civility. So uh, a yeah. separate subgroup has been working um, with CAPS to develop that training, and I think that we've made good progress. Um, and a pilot's been launched that, look, the plan is starting in 2019 that <coughs> Agency of Transportation will take on responsibility for delivering that training to our new employees, and same with Agency of Human Services, Mm -hmm. and CAPS will be delivering it for all other new employees. And I think that the goal is to continue to have members of our subcommittee um, previewing and providing ideas and, and feedback um, as that training gets finalized and rolled out, so. And the, the sexual harassment one has been revamped considerably. I was gonna share anecdotally with the group. I just had three staff members that took it last week, mm-hmm. and I scheduled a time with them afterwards. I, I hadn't presented anything beforehand, but I, I took our notes that we brought to CAPS, and I sat down and I said, how did you perceive this? And, and on all fronts, they said it was much improved from what we described, so. Mm-hmm. I was really happy to hear that. One of them did make the comments, one of my um, uh, female staff said, I, you know, I sat there and I still felt like I died a thousand deaths because we have a long ways to go in terms of how prevalent this is and how not obvious it is. 
you know, some of the examples were still very obvious and, and felt like, you know, we need to evolve beyond this and, and talk about this at a deeper level. So, um, you know, I think, Laurie, as you said, it's something we'll continue periodically to stay engaged with and review because it is such a key one. And similarly, the implicit bias is another one that we, those were the two main trainings that we decided to focus on as a subcommittee. And I think that one has been, you've been much more involved in that from the get-go, right? And it's, so I'll say that Karen and I have been involved with it from the get-go because really the origins of it um, were from uh, 2017 training that um, we co-developed and delivered to our DMV workforce um, in 2017. So Karen and uh, Bo Yang uh, worked with me and a member of my team and force and we delivered the training to over 200 of our DMV employees over the course of three months, 11 sessions. Really, was it that short? I know, wow. time flies when you're having fun. We started on Valentine's Day with all of the managers and directors and uh, supervisors. And then we rolled it out in five different locations. And that was fairly well received. However, um, I think that since that time, we have continued, it's continuous improvement. So, since then, we've expanded out the training a little bit, um, and we've added some new components. We were invited to deliver that training to the entire Department of Human Resources back in June as part of their Employee Appreciation Day. So we did that, and since then, we've had a chance to um, continue to do a lot of tweaking and uh, we delivered it to ANR's uh, leadership team and division directors, and um, we are now in the process of rolling it out to our whole workforce, um, starting with our finance and administration division, starting this Friday. So we have seven sessions um, scheduled for December and January, and I want to extend an invitation to all the council members and everyone else here if you want to come and preview this, since we do keep coming up with new components, the whole idea is to get people really engaged and no shame, no blame, even when there should be, um, and to try to provide some good tools and resources. So we're focusing even more than in the past on some pre-training and post-training homework assignments and resources. And among other things, um, everybody's had to take the workplace civility self-assessment before the training. And because all of our workforce has already seen the out video at least once, in some cases many times, we've built in some activities that kind of build from that one. But we've asked them all in advance of coming to the training to rewatch the out video on their own and then we're using vignettes that are also part of the OUCH series um, during the training itself. So, um, I'm excited about that. Our secretary, Jill Flynn, has made this a pretty high commitment and high priority, and he wants to see us um, roll this out to our whole workforce in 2019. He hasn't issued a mandate or a directive um, in that regard, but we're already working on scheduling that, so. And there was one third item that uh, the subcommittee is working on, and it has the uh, the least tra well, least traction. It's really notional still at this point, but we're uh, we're hoping to create a, an inventory, a list of any training offered by the state that deals with diversity or workforce equity, and uh, beyond the ones that are offered, we also are hoping to find um, other resources, maybe out of state trainers that could be brought in if you have some things very specialized, like a specialized accommodation that you need or, um, you know, uh, issues around, uh, you know, trans terminology for trans employees, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, again, we it's, it's been a goal of ours. It's the one that's sort of been on the back burner, so I'm open in the year ahead that's something that we'll produce. That's where we're at. Karen, did you have stuff you wanted to add? I jumped in in the middle of Joe's um, in a detail. No, I think you guys want to know. I think you covered everything. Yes, thank you. It sounds like transportation's a little ahead of everybody else on the implicit bias train. 
I would say, because well, I'm not aware of it going on elsewhere. Do you guys offer that in uh, I, I the think future? That, I think that the plan is that it will be offered if it's not offered already, and yeah. that, um, as, as Lori said, it's going to be at least one component of it will be part of the uh, onboarding process for new employees. Mm -hmm. Was the, excuse me, was the DMV training a part of the settlement? Yeah, it was, okay. it was. Thank you. But it was also kind of a good springboard for us and um, I wanna just give a big shout out to Karen and the HRC because they've been incredibly generous with all of the material that they've developed and, um, and we've shamelessly borrowed from all of that, and, and we in turn have, have tried to come up with some additional things, and you've continued, Karen, to provide <coughs> lots and lots of resources as you come across them. So there is a series of videos that we've talked about, I think, as in this group before, but the Grovo videos, it's 20 different videos. They are available free of charge, and I'm not a huge fan or proponent of online training in this area versus in person, but these are pretty good, um, and we're using them as part of our pre and post training. So, um, and you've come across lots of other things yep. and shared as well. Yep. So, once you start paying attention, it's all over the place. <laughs> it huge, really is. It's a huge conversation right now in the um, American Bar Association with women attorneys and the difference in the way that female attorneys are treated in trial and by juries and by judges and, and the effect that that has on the out, ultimate outcome of cases, which is really disturbing mm -hmm. um, and interesting. Well, what's been the reaction of the, of the employees and staff? Is it, oh my gosh, I wasn't aware of this? Or? I think for, for me, um, a lot of the reaction has been um, really positive, that people didn't really understand implicit bias, didn't understand the science behind it, the brain science behind it, and that didn't understand how it then affects their perceptions and behavior and plays out you know, in, in systemic racism, for example. And so it's been interesting to help people make those connections um, and I think that the hope is that once they've made those connections they become a little more self-aware about when their behavior may be <coughs> over into something that's contributing or ways that they could maybe help get involved to help change the systemic racism or gender bias that comes out. I mean, I, I would agree that I'm always surprised at how positive the response is on the part of the employees that we have that go through the training. And I don't think that, I mean, we have anonymous evaluation forms. Um, it's really eye-opening for some people. We're definitely trying to provide them with some tools to not just be more aware of it, but to actually do something with that. And that's the really hard part, is changing the behaviors um, and giving them the tools so that they are aware when they might be engaging in it. So you created and, and helped to find a lot of great examples that gave people some real aha moments. Um, and that's what people kind of um, like to experience, I think, during the training. Um, you know, there's one thing that always grabs people and it's the sound that you play when it's garbled in mm -hmm. some, it's um, these two different uh, present, so this is from, uh, I guess a tour bus, let's say, or it's from uh, yeah, yeah, like a tour bus. Um, and so the first time that you play it, you can't make out what, any, what they're saying at all. It's completely garbled. And then you play the tape, um, a, again in the regular version and it's like uh, the bus stops at Constitution Avenue and the next time you go back and play the really garbled version you can hear it perfectly it takes it's so easy once you've heard it in the real version to then make it out and it really is helpful for people to see how quickly our brains can operate to try to make sense of stuff so we work all the time with our hiring managers and other folks about 
of bringing people into our workplace where English is not their native language and constantly, especially in jobs that are either um, maintenance um, or technical jobs, we're always told that I can't understand what this person's saying and this is a safety risk. And they can't understand me and it's a safety risk and stuff. And there's so many different things that we can do about that. But giving people concrete examples of how quickly we can train our brains so that we can understand one another is, um, I think, a helpful thing. So it's just one example. Karen, is there, is there some kind of like measurement criteria that you have established or are planning to establish to be able to find out if progress is actually being made in any way? No, we haven't done any like follow-up mm -hmm. um, stuff and in part because it's hard to do mm -hmm. um, always, but yeah, that would be helpful. And with this training, is this training intended to satisfy the criteria that's uh, laid out in uh, in Act 9, uh, Section 503, the training required there? Um, uh, 5003, right? The Racial Equity Advisory Panel training? The, uh, <clears throat> the training in, 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 in Section 5003 of Act 9, there's um, some training that um, the director is being called for to work in conjunction with human resources on to conduct uh, uh, this training is uh, for um, Regarding the nature and scope of systemic racism right. uh, or institutionalized nature of racism, yeah, no, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, yeah, I, think I think that's, that's something that's, that's something be that's the, the, the new executive director. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I'll I'll go next. I'll talk about the um, the data and measurement group. So we had um, a couple of discussions about that focused on. Um, talking about how we can complement the work of the racial, the executive director of racial equity and the racial equity advisory panel, which is focused uh, on race and that we may be able to think of some ways to do some data collection that are around other, other uh, demographics other than race. Uh, it seems like it may be kind of an opportunity as, as we're focusing particularly on race, it gives us a good opportunity to focus on some other things as well. And so we're, um, we're still formulating various plans about how we might do that, and that's something we can talk about for our, our 2019 goals, and um, we'd be thrilled to get input on that when we get to that part of the agenda. Uh, then the more concrete idea that we talked about was uh, using a exit interview process to try to get some more information about, uh, in general, why people are leaving state service, and then in particular, um, we've noticed that people of color leave at a higher rate than people who are white and seeing if we can get any information about what might be going on there. So AOT has done a, ex, exit interviews. They did a whole, um, it was a whole project with UVM, a research project to really look at what's going on with the, the AOT employees. And so we have that as a pretty good model both for the content, although we would tweak it some, you know, to get more of what we wanted, but also for the process that they were able to work with DHR to get that out to the employees. And um, so I talked with Chris McConnell, who's the director of field operations at DHR, who says, um, sure, we can do this, no problem. So he and I are gonna talk again by the end of the week to get a little bit more specific about what might be involved. But um, he was talking about the, uh, some kind of new software or something that CAPS has. I don't know if any of the DHR people are familiar with this that allows for pretty, uh, for easier distribution of things like surveys. And um, so, and it's, it's kind of going along with the onboarding process that they're working on now so that there are things that are automatically going to new employees. And so we've got an infrastructure that will make it, should make it, knock on wood, pretty easy to get out exit surveys as well. Uh, and um, so it would be a written survey. It would be That's an online like. survey. Yep. And yep. Is there any way of ensuring that people do it? Well, yeah. no, probably not. <laughs> uh, so the not everybody in the AOT study filled them out, but. Um, Right. In the think, AOT you know. study, um, so we worked with UVM. Um, this was a two-year study that UVM did for us, um, and probably the 
greatest takeaway in terms of a work product was this exit uh, survey questionnaire that we developed um, was on the technical advisory committee for that, um, for that study. And I think that um, we struggled with all of the pros and cons of going online um, anonymous versus a sit down face to face. And I still struggle with it. So, hey, Boar. So the process that we came up with, um, we used the survey questionnaire, but the order of preference when a hiring manager sends to our field office, um, uh, an employee is, is leaving and their resignation letter or retirement, whatever it is, separation, um, then the goal is that our field office reaches out to the employee and invites them to come in for an in-person survey and if, or, or interview, exit interview. And if, if they're not available to do that or logistically, because uh, they're working in a remote location, they can do it by phone. And then the last um, best option is to do the actual survey itself, just fill it out on paper. And I think why we want to, why we want to encourage people to come in and talk is because people are going to be more forthcoming in 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 person interviews sometimes, and um, if they're not having to commit in writing, um, and it also gives whoever's interviewing them a chance to tease out some of the issues. I don't know, Valerie, you're nodding, and I think yeah. you can probably we, relate to this because you've probably seen both. We in recommend operation. the same approach because sometimes somebody will make a statement and it's really unclear what they mean or or what the context might have been. So in an in, in-person interview, you have an opportunity to unpack some of that a little bit and, and work through it and, and really get to the root of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So we have the same order of preference, I guess, when we offer them as well. The nice part about having just the online survey is that some people do feel more comfortable yeah. with an anonymous survey. They're yeah. going to share some stuff that they wouldn't otherwise share because they don't want to burn their bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't want to stir things up on their way out and leave under a cloud. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And, and the other thing is in terms of data collection, because if people are doing this all online, then it's much, much easier to collect right. and compile it's all the data. already there, yes. 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 But that's great that Chris is open to Yeah, he was enthusiastic about it. And I think there will be, there's always going to be limitations because there will always be people who, who don't want to say, you know, my supervisor was terrible. No matter what format we, no, we give it to them, no matter how much anonymity we, we promise them, they're just not going to do that. And uh, so, but, you know, given within that, we may be able to get some information that we don't have currently. And, and that it may also help to contribute to a culture throughout state government of doing exit interviews or some kind of exit process, mm -hmm. which I think would be really helpful because it's, it's pretty spotty right now, right? Yeah. The other thing that we're developing and trying to launch is stay interviews as opposed to exit interviews. Mm -hmm. And it's part of what the UVM study did was to also work with focus groups of those employees who are actually staying to find out why are they staying um, and not just focus on the people who decided to leave. So we've just finished developing state interview questions for um, supervisors and managers to have with their employees on a kind of regular basis to find out how it's going, probably enough. So we'll, we're happy to share those too. Great. Great. Thank you. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. I've done exit interviews before with individuals where I got to know that individual better during an exit interview than I ever have before mm -hmm. and thought that it was an absolute shame mm -hmm. that this didn't happen before. Yep. So I, that's a great uh, approach. We're trying to figure out all the ways that we can help build the relationship and the connection between the supervisors and the employees from day one. And part of why I'm excited about the statewide onboarding process is that it does include a lot of guidance for supervisors, um, but it also helps um, in terms of making sure that there are regular, regularly scheduled um, opportunities for sit-downs and check-ins and things like that. Also, assigning people a buddy as soon as they come on board. Because I think that part of the reason why we are seeing a churn and people um, that are leaving 
um, is because of that lack of connection. And uh, I don't think that supervisors have always prioritized that because they've got a lot on their plate. Um, but hopefully that will make a difference. And hopefully some of the data that we collect will also help shed light on the fact, as Carrie said, of why the turnover rate for people of color um, is almost double uh, for uh, uh, employees who are white in state government. So, or we should give you a chance to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was late. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. That's, the, that's the truth and that's the excuse. So, um, Bor Yang, Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So our little subcommittee that you're a part of already kind of shared what um, we've been up to in 2018, but we haven't yet talked about 2019 and beyond. And I don't know if you want to add anything, not knowing anything that we've shared so far. No, I totally trust that you've shared everything that was good and necessary. Thank you. And then some. Yeah, and then some. So data, folks, are you all set? That's it. That's our update. Is there anything you wanted to add? I think you covered. Well, Bill, <laughs> you saved the best for last, so. Well, I won't say that yet. <laughs> no, um, I just wanted to kind of just touch on some highlights that uh, you know I think that are notable things that in the last since we last met. Um, we do have a few other new. Uh, people on our subcommittee who aren't unfortunately aren't here, Casey uh, Diedrich and uh, Dana Hutchinson. So Dana was previously a member of this council, I think, and she's she going to be rejoining. Um, so she's part of this, uh, the committee, she wanted to be part of the committee too, so part of the subcommittee. Uh, but Lori had already talked about in uh, the onboarding project, which, which is a really exciting thing. We're going to go to a more standardized onboarding and retention um, process and, uh, for, you know, as far as when people come on board, they have the same experience regardless of which agency or department they come from. Uh, Lori touched on some of the themes around, you know, having a buddy, <clears throat> getting these uh, hiring, the hiring managers getting scheduled emails of when to check in. So they're, they're, it's not on them to try to remember when they're supposed to have their check-ins with their employees, their new employees, and see how things are going. Uh, and I think, Carol, you were referring to the Cisco software system. It probably was the LMS that we're is the you know, kind of the tool we're using to do these schedule things. And I think Chris was probably referring to that too. Sounds like it, yeah. Because we're kind of doing the same thing for onboarding and attention. Yeah. So that's an exciting thing, Lori had mentioned. Uh, we are piloting now in a couple departments, um, HR being one of them. Um, I think the labor uh, is another. Uh, and then we're going to take it statewide in the spring. So we'll hopefully get all the bugs out of it. <laughs> Anything, any communication problems or issues or anything uh, and, and have that up and running in the spring all over the state and be really consistent because um, it's, it, it's very difficult for people that people don't realize that um, the onboarding experience is directly related to the retention, people's retention. People make that decision to leave, um, you know, within the last, the first like month of their employment, if they have a bad onboarding experience, they're more likely to say, this company does not value me and I'm going to look elsewhere. So. That was one thing, um, as you all know, and you're probably sick of me hearing, hearing me talk about it, we did uh, finally go live with Success Factors Recruiting, our new recruiting uh, software. It's a cloud-based software, um, and it is live. We've been live now for about uh, going on two months, and uh, things have gone well so far. I think it's, we've had very little issues with uh, external candidates or internal candidates not being able to use the system. Uh, we, we, to design and design copious uh, uh, health guides, so everybody can uh, you know, refer those guides when needed. Um, we are also uh, we have some one person dedicated to support if people are having issues with the system. Um, and then uh, one of the reasons why, and I've talked about this before in other meetings, but one of the reasons why we did go with Success Factor Recruiting is they have a very uh, very visionary about the future. About um, they have actually a program, an initiative called Business Beyond Bias. So work really, you know, we, that really resonated with us when we were reviewing systems. And uh, I think uh, it's still on their roadmap. So they haven't fully implemented it, but they are slowly putting things in um, into place, like um, 
doing a job analyzer. They have a job analyzer tool so you can look at a job description. And right now, it will tell you, it will give you suggestions if there is perceived gender bias within your job descriptions and give you suggestions. And we're hoping they expand that to other types of bias too so that we can be very uh, you know, uh, mindful of those types of things when we do. Uh, when we do write our job descriptions and our job postings. Um, and you know, it was, it was one of the things that uh, Valerie and I were in a meeting with some AHS leadership um, and helping them kind of, they want to improve their uh, diversity recruitment and helping them and they were very interested in hearing more and, uh, about that and, and, and using that. The other thing and, uh, that came out of that meeting is uh, we're going to standardize some language for all AHS job postings to encourage more uh, minority uh, people to uh, to apply for uh, for positions, you know, we're going to be more explicit in our language. I guess that's the goal, anyways, and working on that. I don't know if there's anything else that you know where we stand on that. I can think of another project that you've worked on, but I don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, no, I, I, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, I I think it's borrowing from <clears throat> some of the language that the health department is using <clears throat> right, and trying to right. expand that agency wide. And then um, I had a, a meeting with that same group this morning, and also. Um, that led to a conversation just about websites and, and you know what's what's the image of AHS or AHS departments out there and is that going to align with the language that we're using? So I think it's going to become a slightly bigger project, but yeah. a meaningful one for sure. Absolutely. And you've been working on um, the whole visual impact and branding the uh, state of Vermont as an employer for a while, and I think you did do like a whole series of videos maybe this past summer um, or spring or summer. I know well, you were it was actually uh, last summer or summer before, so we've been doing a lot of like realistic preview videos. I've kind of we, we did one uh, neo video um, a couple years ago, kind of to for new employees, kind of welcoming them to the state. And why people talk in various roles talk about why they like their why their work matters, why they, why they like the benefits. Their team, things like that, and so we, uh, we I took some of that, a lot of that raw video, and edited it down to so specific, in specific for, for specific occupations where people were talking specifically about their job and why their work matters. Because we got a lot of video that we, you know, that we could not fit into the eight minutes of the original Neo video. So we we subdivided that into some of the, um, the, the some of these you know, what we call it, real job preview type videos. So people were talking about that. So just employ uh, our employer brand, moving that you know forward. The new career website is uh, a new uh, is a great opportunity because it gives the, us that opportunity to mar market ourselves. Uh, we are hoping to put more um, emphasis on diversity and inclusion recruitment when we you know a as we launch this. Um, we you know we actually talk a little bit more about it and then we are starting. I know when we met when I did the demo, we're working on the links to get proper links to the right things to that. Uh, you know, to, for more information type of thing. So um, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? Well, well he was here. <laughs> well, yeah. And, 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 and so, uh, she has uh, a self-promotion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, talking about uh, Creative Workforce Solutions and our partnership with them, Nat mm -hmm. uh, Piper, who, uh, you know, who's been my primary liaison, and he's been you know, my, one of my primary liaisons about working with hiring managers from the state. Um, to uh, create more uh, awareness and create more opportunities for people with disabilities to uh, have get progressive employment opportunities and you can talk a lot more eloquently about that than I can but uh, you know just more this is a program that was that creative workforce solutions was offering to uh, the state to more the private sector but we took it inward and offered it to state hiring managers and I really think this year has had we've had a lot of successes and, we have, and, and we, yeah. we've gotten a lot of conversations going between hiring managers and, and CWS's clients and you know the point we've got people acting fairly far down the road with even permanent <coughs> job interviews and things like that so um, you know hopefully you know I don't know if I'm gonna have access <laughs> not <laughs> with that but uh, you know going forward well, I really want to continue that uh, that partnership um, I think that was pretty much it for me. I probably have spoken enough already. So. You know, Bill, one, one other thing that comes to mind is Nat's, uh, Nat is our business account manager currently in Central Vermont, but he's moving into the mature worker program manager yeah. position. Yeah. And we see also an angle around yes. mature workers mm -hmm. and returnships and yes. having mature exactly. workers see the state of Vermont as another potential avenue for coming back into the workforce. You know, we're finding more and more people retire and then soon re realize retirement isn't everything they thought it was going to be. <laughs> yes, it is. Including <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so that notion of, of uh, part-time opportunities or flex opportunities and, and openings for mature workers right. is one that's also worth exploring. Absolutely, yeah. So, and thank you for joining us. Here. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, now that sure. Uh, I'm Hugh Bradshaw, I'm the Employment Services Manager at Voc Rehab Vermont, and I also uh, head up the uh, CWS Creative Workforce Solutions Initiative in the Agency of Human Services, which is about connecting folks with barriers to employment to employers, both in the public and private sectors. And Diane is following me very shortly. We had oh, some good. confusion over timing and time of meeting, so, so she's you, on, she's you're on the her amazing way. race and you won. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> she had uh, more pressing things than I did, I guess. <laughs> she's on her way. I'm glad you're both coming. Um, since the work of the group that um, that you're a part of, that Bill's a part of, I guess I'm a part of as well, is like a subcommittee of the council um, in car to carry out the 2016 executive order. Um, I think it is worthy for us to capture some of the highlights and successes. I don't know that we managed to do that as much in last year's annual report that we probably could have, should have, because it does happen to be one of the success stories. And I think Creative Workforce Solutions, I can't say enough good things about uh, the level of service that you deliver. And um, if there are any particular things that come to mind, um, that you want to share that took place in 2018, that would well, be great. Well, certainly, I mean, we could, we could provide information on the things that are happening in the field, but I can say, you'll, you know, kudos to actually VTrans, because okay. VTrans has been really an amazing partner for us, uh, and Morris we've been working very closely yeah. with. We've developed an MOU between uh, Dale and AHS and yeah. VTrans around work experiences. We've supported several individuals in work experiences, and in fact, I think we have a couple of young folks now uh, working for you. So yeah, hired full time. It's been paid a wonderful employment. thing. Yeah. yeah. And so, again, progressive employment is a continuum of options that we can offer any hiring manager, whether in the public or private sector, and everything from informational interviews to uh, job shadows, company tours. And work experiences is a big uh, portion of the work that we do. And it's really, a, for lack of a better description, it's a try before you buy model for employers and state hiring managers to see if it's a fit and make sure it's a fit before they make a hiring decision, which is very attractive uh, to folks because in this labor market right now, it's a bit of a challenge finding individuals. And oftentimes, what we're seeing, certainly in the private sector, and I think the state reflects this somewhat is they're hiring folks and finding out two or three weeks into it that it's really not a match. And they're so desperate that they continue in this cycle of hiring and losing and hiring and losing. And we see progressive employment as a really nice tool to make sure that it's a match before they go down that road of employment with folks. So it works, works really well. Works. Yeah, it's a great model. Thank you. Um, and I know that we've talked in the, at the council about the idea of expanding it to uh, work with some advocacy agencies um, outside of uh, just the pool of people with disabilities yep. to include uh, more diverse uh, populations. Absolutely. So, And certainly at its core, is it's an opportunity both for the individual and for the business to look for that match. So it, as much as it's geared towards hiring managers, it's all about the also about the individual having an opportunity to explore mm -hmm. and find out what is this really like by being immersed in it for a little pe short period of time. And it, it's, it's just as valuable to find out that it's not a match right. as it is to find out that it is. And oftentimes mm -hmm. when you find out it's not a match, that's a starting point for a conversation about where is the next place to look and how do we move a person forward. Well, and it's the model that um, many state agencies and departments already um, kind of de facto employ when uh, many of the permanent hires into classified positions come from the uh, pool of people who've uh, been working as temporary Absolutely. employees. It's just that the yep. difference here is that you do such a great job of supporting people through their um, the process of uh, them exploring uh, the employment process and providing them with all the supportive services and bells and whistles, and you do a great job of vetting candidates as well. Thank so, you. yeah. Are you working on a, the uh, offender reentry as well? Absolutely, a big part of the work. Um, we're actually in conversations right now around how do we build uh, training programs in the facility so that folks are prepared on release to go into employment, including we've had some early discussions around 
uh, Skype capability, so you could actually do an interview or an informational interview with an employer while you're still in the facility. And you know, we think that that level of engagement will help lower some of the fears folks have about on release, where they're going to go and who they're going to talk to. So in the women's facility, just very recently, we started talking about uh, uh, certified production technician training in the facility to prepare people to go into manufacturing opportunities. And we met with some of the women in the facility, and they were, it was interesting. They were, wow, I didn't realize that was something we could do. And it was, a, it was an eye-opener for them, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a real opportunity to provide that. There, there's a lot of idle time in the facilities, and so having training time, and, and I had an early conversation. I know the new um, commissioner is looking at reinstating good time. And I'm floating the idea of what if good time was a trade for workforce training. So for every X number of hours in workforce training, you have uh, some time knocked off your sentence, which would be an interesting model as well. So yes, we're very, obviously in VR, we see many of the folks in corrections as our customers, because if you peel back the onion one layer, you quickly find disability and trauma and substance use and all the other things that would make people eligible, so. Lots of Sorry, I'm We're happy that you're here. So, want to give you a chance to get your coat off. I also want to invite, well, first of all, want to invite you to introduce yourself. Um, we are being taped, and so I just want to remind everybody, but uh, Jerome, the organization that you're with is? Onion River Community Access. Okay. And so we'll give Diane a chance to introduce herself. And I wanted to invite Hugh and Diane and Board to grab some lunch because there's still a ton of food. So, yeah. So, is that all our committees? Yes. I think we've run out of committees. Yep. We certainly haven't yep. run out of ideas and things to talk about. Um, so, do we want to? Well, let's talk Move about the, the racial oh. equity advisory panel, and then we can kind of fold in whatever. That sounds great. Ah. Hello, hello. Good. Do you want to take a break and expand our tables? Yeah. I think we might want to expand yeah. the tables. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and also give Thank Curtis you. a chance to introduce himself as well. So, so maybe we'll take a five-minute break, and that sounds great. And then the we'll. Tables. Yeah. We'll come back, we'll yep. reintroduce, and we'll, we'll, we'll spread jump the to agenda item three-ish. Yes. So, yeah. It's a good partnership. Yeah, it's, sorry. It's, it's a good partnership. What I do? <laughs> Nothing but good things. And someday I will get it connected to success back in from your sales I did say what <laughs> Well, yeah, we're ready. Think that I know. You're ready to tell me you years. They probably have wrong information. No, I just have a phone that you can listen. Old work phone. So an old work phone that you will no longer answer. Exactly. And I don't want to include you with a new phone or a new company. You can just put in a new set of dates. You said dates. Some kind of process, a separate process. Uh, me. You said something about inclusion and groups. I was trying to figure out what that is. Yes. Oh, well, I was talking about for like the product, the SAB product. I see. They have a they have an initiative called Business Beyond Bias. Okay. And that's what they're they're working toward okay. implementing it. Okay. The software. They're starting doing some things around analyzing job descriptions mm -hmm. for right now for gender bias, mm -hmm. and then getting into other types of bias now. Got it. Should we start back up again? I think we should, and since okay. we've been joined by several people since yeah. the first go around, would it make sense for us to do another go around so everybody knows who's part of the discussion? Yeah, let's just do a quick okay. go around. We'll put Bor on the spot, and you can lead us off. Sarah Bor Yang, Executive Director of Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Diane Delmas, and I'm the Director of the Voc Rehab Program for the State of Vermont. Brad Freeland, Deputy Secretary of the Agency Administration. Bill Myers, Talent Acquisition Consultant, Department of Human Resources. Aditi Lagu, uh, Labor Relations Manager, Department of Human Resources. Curtis Reed, uh, Executive Director, Vermont Partnership for Fairness University. Clark Hughes, Executive Director of Justice for All. Joe Nussbaum, Director of Vermont Adult Protective Services and LGBT and Liaison. Karen Richards, I'm a panel member with the Racial Equity Advisory Panel. 
I'm Lori Dauburn. I'm with the Office of Civil Rights and Labor Compliance at the Agency of Transportation. And Hugh Bradshaw, Employment Services Manager, Voc Rehab Vermont. Rachel Allen, I'm a Secretary of DHR, a designee for this council. Tom Waldman, I'm the General Counsel of the Department of Human Resources and the former Commissioner's designee to the Council. It's still just hanging around. Hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> I'm Carrie Brown, I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. And Valerie Nickel, HR Manager with the Department of Human Resources. Well, thank you all. Um, I think that it was great hearing from all the different committees about what we've been focusing on over 2018, and, and some of it also led to some of the ideas that we have for building on some of that work as we head into a new calendar year. Um, we particularly are excited about the prospect of working closely with uh, a to be uh, identified and hired a uh, racial equity uh, executive director, a newly created position. And I believe that that whole process has just gotten started with um, the racial equity panel being constituted. So Karen, you are the sole <laughs> member of the panel that uh, we invited, Carrie extended an invitation to all the panel members, but of course, um, it's a yes. busy time of year. Schedule um, conflicts. And, yeah, schedule-wise, so mm -hmm. we're fortunate to have you here, and I don't know if you can share with us a little bit about where you're at in the process and, and where we're headed. Yep. Um, so the panel consists of um, Andrea Betts, who is the chair, um, Clarence Davis, um, Stephanie Seguino, uh, Judge uh, Nancy Waples, and myself. And um, we had a meeting at which we reviewed a uh, job description that HR had helpfully provided us with a um, starting point for. Um, revised that job description, and that was posted, I believe, the last week in November. And we try to post it as widely as possible. Um, it is on HR, um, HR website or HR recruitment page, right? And then um, is also was posted in Idealist on LinkedIn, on Indeed, um, and I think there were a couple of other ones that were identified. Well, we identified. did a little bit of a little social media posting too for you. Yeah, and seven days I think is also going to be running an ad. So we are trying to reach out as much as possible to get um, diverse applicants, um, including national um, applicants. And the um, soft closing date is January 7th, and we have a meeting scheduled I think on January 14th or 15th, I can't remember, um, to review the resumes that have come in at that point, but we will continue to be able to continue to accept um, applications after that point. And we are encouraging anyone who has groups um, that would be helpful in getting the word out to spread that word and help us spread that word um, so that we can really get the best possible candidates. Um, we are behind schedule because we were supposed to have um, presented the governor with a um, list of the qualified applicants by January 1st, and he was supposed to make an appointment by February 1st, but because um, there was a lag in um, the appointment, um, I won't say from where, um, <laughs> um, there was, um, it, it was, uh, we were not constituted soon enough to really um, be able to meet that, and we figured it was better to take a little bit longer, even if we're out of compliance with the statutory deadlines, and make sure that we get really qualified, good candidates, rather than to rush the process and end up potentially um, without such candidates. So um, hopefully, we'll only be about a month behind the schedule. Can you say how many candidates you have so far? Um, I can't because they're all going to HR, so oh. I don't. I have no. But Bill does, but no. I'm well, sure they do. <laughs> so, I think I, they're, yeah, I think they're... I they're not going through the regular process. Oh, they're not, they're not going through no. the regular process. They're just emailed. They're not going directly to a uh, yep. field HR person. Mm -hmm. I see. So, well, I think all of us should be trying to put on our thinking caps and figure out ways that we can push this 
out there to as broad a uh, um, cast as wide a net as we possibly can, um, nationally, internationally, to try to find the best possible candidates, as you said. Um, and I think that the job description, as I understand it, um, does a great job of capturing what you're looking for in terms of experience. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, one of the things we talked about was that this is um, a position where really you, you're looking for somebody who understands um, organizations and how to make organizational change, right? Because that's really um, where you're where you're looking for that person to be able to step in and um, be able to do the work. So that'll be a, a big part of, I think, what the panel's looking for anyway in the applicants. So to whom should we address uh, suggestions in terms of where to, sure. to promote? Sure. Uh, Thank you. National Bar Association, for example. There's a, an association of African Americans in higher education. I forget the exact title of the group, but I'll give that to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so those, are the, those are the two. Do you know if they're, do they cost money? <laughs> <laughs> Is money an object? <laughs> uh, apparently, it may be <laughs> somewhat of an object, but I don't know. I think the Vermont Bar Association is like 50 or $60 if you're a member. Yeah, yeah, BBA, yeah, BBA is yeah. pretty yeah. inexpensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. ABA, I don't know what. So. And do you have other items on your, on your to-do list so far or, or plans for them? Um, no, I mean, I think that really it, doing the hiring is it, because it's going to be interviewing, it's going to be uh, an involved process, so mm -hmm. that's going to really consume our time. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Fast checking all of those. Yes. Yes. In pieces. Yes. I know that this is probably hard to maybe um, envision, but if you could think ahead to how our council might be able to best support the work of the person who gets selected, knowing a lot about the work that needs to get done, and also to support the work of the panel, because you're gonna be an ongoing panel, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think um, having this group have connections both with um, this panel and with the um, panel that's working on reforms in the criminal and juvenile justice system would be really key to making sure that that work remains coordinated, uh, uh, obviously along with the Human Rights Commission, which this also person is, uh, the executive director is also supposed to liaise with. So I think if, if all of those folks stay in some kind of contact with each other, we'll have the best um, chance of making sure that we're not working at cross purposes and that we're really all you know, focused on the same things moving forward. And I think um, it'll probably be helpful to the executive director to be able to come to this group to say, this is an issue that I've spotted in, you know, state government that could use maybe the bigger picture of mm -hmm. entire state government thinking about it or looking at it and um, <coughs> ways that this group might be able to identify things that we can do that could be helpful in a, you know, a, side come kind of coming at things sideways as well so I think I think there's a lot of room for everyone to work together and I think it's just important that we maintain those relationships and ensure that they happen I mean I think that when we develop the model with um, having the three different subcommittees of the council um, this was before the position or the panel had been created but in many ways it reflects um, some of the nature of the work that's going to be um, undertaken by the new executive director in terms of data collection and analysis, training, and focusing on recruitment and retention issues. So hopefully it will mean that we'll already have done a little bit of the groundwork and then we can focus our efforts in the direction that the executive director 
right. sees that there's the greatest need. Yeah. I'd just like to add that we've the Secretary of Administration's office has um, has been rearranging offices on the fifth floor you know, with, in conjunction with the governor's office, and um, there's not a lot of room up there. But uh, we have found we have moved people around and created an office on the fifth floor outside of the Secretary of Administration's office, um, and are just buying the furniture now and getting that office set up for um, to be occupied by as soon as um, someone's hired. So that's all in the process too. That's great. And then the only thing to add, I guess, to the to, to what Karen mentioned is that when the panel process, the panel will evaluate candidates and submit qualified candidate names to the governor and the governor makes the ultimate selection. Right. Just an observation that the holidays tends not to be a good time to recruit. Mm -hmm. People are distracted, so Right, and that was one of the reasons we pushed the um, closing date out into January rather than trying to rush it was that, you know, once people get past January 1st and are focusing on their lives again, that, that gives them some time to do it. And I, I think if we don't get a significant number of applications in at that point, we'll just maybe reschedule our meeting and leave it open for a little while longer. Because mm -hmm. um, we definitely want to have enough applic applications to make it work. Yeah, I think that was definitely a concern, just and it, it just worked out that way based on when the panel could get together, unfortunately. So, so has there been any um, surveillance on social media about the position, about the work that the state's doing? I don't know. I don't have access to it. Certainly, one, one, way, one of the ways that applicants would now, would be if they saw something on News One, if you know, sold an article to the National Association of Black Journalists or Hispanic Journalists, uh, sort of pick up a story about what's happening in Vermont, um, and then they could push the word out and say that, oh, Vermont, there's something happening yeah. there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so. <coughs> Pushing the uh, uh, job description or announcement out to the <coughs> media nationally um, would be, I think, one way of, of uh, broadening, broadening the net. And, and doing it for free. And doing right. it for free. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> money won't be an object. Yeah. Money won't be an object. If News One picks it up, yeah. Uh, or Latin Times picks it up, um, then, yeah, we do move that. Yeah. Karen, I don't know if I, I can, maybe I can reach out to Rebecca Kelly from the governor's office. She's a communications director. And see if they, you know, we can assist on. Good, yeah. 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 There had oh, been a oh. press release at the time that the governor had issued his executive order that's the companion piece of this and um, maybe that a, a follow-up um, press release yeah. could come out just to update mm -hmm. and pull some of the information about why this administration feels that this yeah. is so valuable and important at this point in time. I know there was a press release out of the commissioner's office when the panel was mm -hmm. constituted yeah. with everybody's bio and you know a little bit yeah. about what the panel's mission or immediate mission is but I don't I don't know whether that was sent specifically uh, to the outlets that you're suggesting. I'm sure my guess is it probably wasn't. Right. Yeah. Um, another starting point might be the Department of Tourism and Marketing. Um, we updated their database about five years ago from 250 million markets in terms of email addresses. Whether or not they have maintained that as a group, or if they've simply integrated it throughout their system, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of. Um, but I would send it out through their network because you would not you have a much greater, well, there, there's a known quantity of 250 minority markets that they're reaching already. And so this information might be able to augment 
um, you know, what they're trying to do in terms of selling the state of Vermont. So. I'm curious as well. So you recently retired and Bohr uh, was selected and appointed as your successor, but that recruitment was relatively recent and might have attracted some candidates who might also be interested in this position. So how did you, how did the HRC go about recruiting and did you engage in a lot of social media? Um, I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know next to nothing because I was not part right. of that. Okay, either. you weren't part of the no, recruitment? So, yeah. All right. The commissioners did that. Okay. Uh, well, it might be worth reaching out to some of the commissioners from the HRC and just find out how they um, planned and carried out their recruitment campaign. Since they obviously came up with a fabulous um, successor for Karen, um, but it may have also attracted people from out of state. I think that their focus was more in state than it was <clears throat> out of state. I don't think they did a lot of um, out of state focus on that. But I could be wrong. So I'm thinking about when this person starts and you know their their first day or their first week and will the how kind of direction is gonna work and supervision and um, because it's such a it's such an enormous beast of a job. Um, so I'm wondering if either the administration or the racial equity advisory panel or the or together, will there be kind of a, a little bit of an initial plan, like here's what we want you to get started on, or is that all gonna be developed when they start, and how's it gonna work on an ongoing basis? So the, the way that the statute is set up is that the supervision and management for the position is actually in the agency of administration, mm -hmm. so um, the person I believe will be reporting directly to Suzanne Young. Oh, okay. Um, and the panel's role is really um, at a different level. It's more um, a larger, a bigger picture, and the person has some responsibility to report back to the panel, but it's not like the Human Rights Commission where the direction is coming from the commissioners. It's, it's more like an advisory <laughs> right. um, relationship with both the administration and with this individual. So. Um, but I think there could certainly be some conversations between Suzanne Young and the panel around, you know, how to help get this person started mm -hmm. and who they need to know and get acquainted with if they're not somebody coming from in-state. Mm -hmm. um, so the general orientation yeah, right. process. So. Right. Yeah. But that hasn't really been teased out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to some That's extent, a good the, question, yeah. Because um, I mean, the closer I will tell you, the closer we get to. February 1st, whenever the hiring process is, that's going to be at the very beginning of the legislative process. It's going to be a very busy process, and there's going to be plenty of distractions. Mm -hmm. So I think the sooner that the panel and, and Suzanne uh, or the administration can get together and have that dialogue to, to develop a, a plan, an onboarding plan, if you will, right. then that's, uh, that's in all our best interest. Have there been any thoughts about priorities? for this person to get started on? Not necessarily specific tasks, but you know, just uh, general not focus. Not that I'm aware of, but mm -hmm. I, I can't say that those discussions haven't happened, but I haven't been exposed to those discussions. I think to a large degree, the duties and responsibilities are defined by the statute. Right. And um, you know, it, in, in many ways, the position, although it's within the agency of administration, um, is, a, is a creature is a creature of the legislature. Um, so, I mean, I think the idea is that the person is going to have significant autonomy to do whatever he or she sees fit uh, to fulfill the duties outlined in the statute. Yeah. I just want to piggyback on that. Tom is, is, is that, and Karen too, is the position actually reports directly to the governor. Yes. <clears throat> the, uh, it's the, it's, uh, the executive director shall report and be under the normal supervision of the governor. Uh, uh, to the extent such supervisory authority is delegated to the Secretary of Administration. So, I mean, it's the governor's discretion right. as to whether or not this position would actually work for the Secretary of Administration. So, we don't want to 
presume that for the, for the governor today, uh, what he's going to what he's going to do, um, I would imagine. The other reason why we sought to try to create as much independence for this position as possible is the very things that we're discussing right now. Is, is that this position should have the autonomy uh, to act uh, in the best interest of um, first and foremost mitigating systemic racism across the entire government. Right? Um, I, I think this is organizational change. Uh, is what we're talking about. Because when you, when you insert a person or a position into a massive organization, there are concentric circles, ripples that come out from that. And if, if, the, um, if the path is not smooth for this position, if, that, if, the, if the culture, if the governor, if the secretary of administration, if those folks on the governor's staff, those folks in concentric circles there around, uh, are not uh, appropriately prepared for what it is that we're getting ready to introduce, then what we're going to get is exactly uh, what you would imagine is, is, is just basically calamity. So I, my questions would really be more around how, you know, how or how will we, if we decide to do so, prepare this administration uh, to receive this position uh, and set it up for success in such a way. Um, that is going to be most effective. Um, you know, what types of conversations need to be had with the governor? What kind of conversations need to be had with the governor's staff? Mind you, um, and I'll stop here for a second, is, is, is that we're inserting a, an executive director in a commissioner's, or at a commissioner's level within this, within this organization. So there's already a, a somewhat of a disadvantage you know, during deliberations and testimony, someone told me that title didn't matter. matter. <laughs> um, so there's going to be um, some challenges already coming out of the gate. So I think that's the appropriate question, at least from my mindset, is, is how do we ready the administration? How do we ready the, um, the, the governor's staff and the governor himself and those who are direct reports therein to be able to set this position up uh, for success? I think that's a great point. Great, a, a great point, and it's it's made in a room where there are ears hearing it who can carry it back. I am a little curious. So you brought up, Mark, that it's putting somebody into like a commissioner level, um, and I'm not sure if that's a reference to. It's not the reporting structure as much as is it at the compensation level because I think. <clears throat> That's what we designed. That's how we designed this position. Um, so when, when we wrote this law, uh, our, initial, our initial intent was that this would be an independent commission, that, the, that there, this position would not report to the governor. That's part of the reason why I was vetoed in the first place, when the first, when the first pass. Okay? So um, when we sent it back up, the compromise was, is, yeah, okay, you can fire this position, because that's the reason why he vetoed it. Um, and I think that, um, well, the question is, is, how many directors do you have reporting to the governor? I don't know. Maybe somebody in this room can tell me. I assume that the governor has a staff of commissioners and secretaries. The governor has a cabinet. Correct. Cabinet, cabinet members report directly to, to the governor. And I think there are, I'm going to say approximately eight, which are all secretaries. Secretaries. And then um, a couple standalone departments, the commissioner of public safety, commissioner of DFR, Commissioner of Labor. <coughs> and corrections? Uh, no. Uh, corrections Commissioner reports to the Secretary of the State Human Services, who reports to the Governor. Okay. I, uh, I, think, um, I think you made my point. My yeah, point yeah, is yeah, that the, yeah, governor, yeah. the Governor has direct reports, and none of his direct reports are titled Executive Director. They are titled Secretary or Commissioner, and they are probably paid along the same line. Somewhere along the same, I, I'm not sure. We, I think we put aside $150,000 for this position, and 80 or 90 is direct compensation. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know what a commissioner makes, but I would imagine probably maybe a little bit more. Than that. I don't know. But the thing well, is, they all is make that more. I'm sorry. I believe that I they, think they make all more. Make maybe about 126 yeah. is where we started in the conversation. Um, right. But I, I think that the um, what, what I'm getting at is is that this this is a you know, I mean, I've I worked corporate America, I've retired Army, I mean, I've, I know what the chain of command means, I know what it means to, to be in an organization and have a title, okay? 
And you know, we're not going to fix that today. But what we can do is, is we, we can talk about, you know, you know, how do you create an environment within an organization where a new function, especially a function as sensitive as the one we're talking about, um, has a chance to, to be successful, especially if they don't have the same title as their peers. <clears throat> Well, I, all I can say is I know that the administration and the governor in particular and the secretary administration are, are you know, they are very open-minded about this. Sure. They look forward to this position, you know, coming on board, and they look forward to working on it. And, and I'll tell you one thing that they take very seriously is following the law. And I think it's, it's laid out pretty clearly in statute, the relationship that is going to exist, you know, with the executive director and the governor's office. So, I, I mean, I think that is, uh, that has to be a degree of, of comfort and, and, and at least um, to know that um, it's, it is laid out, what the relationship needs to be. Absolutely. Uh, but to your point of, of how do we make this as successful as we possibly can is a great point. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I agree with you. The more work we can do now laying sure. that groundwork is, is again, in all our interests. And, and I just want to be really clear yeah. that for clarity that you know, the, the no. question, the rhetorical, if you will, question I'm really laying out is just it's really within the context of the discussion that we're having. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. not really yeah. trying to put anybody on the spot yeah. here. Yeah. You know, though, you know, I, you know, I was really, I'm engaging in such a way as to say, if we're, if we're going to have a conversation on what we can do, which I think is what we were talking about, these are some of the things that we should probably be discussing. <laughs> provide some clarity. I would have to say, though, that hearing that the fifth floor is being rearranged to accommodate having this person yeah. be that close yeah. to the governor That's a good thing. says something in and of itself, I would think. I'll tell you, one, one thing that this governor has been very uh, focused on is, is in, on our chief performance officer, you know, and the work that our chief performance officer is doing across the state. And it's, it's our chief performance officer whose office is being moved around okay. to, to become, yeah. So if that's any indication of, you know, the, 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 the level of seriousness and, um, you know, effort to, to make this work, um, that's, that's where we're at. That's what we're doing. So ultimately, who's responsible for war on board? Um, well, I know that uh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I, they're great questions. I know that uh, our commissioner of DHR has is, is been doing a lot of the support work and working with the um, the, the advisory panel to 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 onboard that. Um, I, I think the you're going to find the secretary of administration is going to play a very big role in that, and and in conjunction with uh, maybe meeting with the uh, the panel, it has to be those are the two key players I think that's going to be involved. On an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So, can I charge the panel with taking the lead on onboarding? On what? On onboarding with these personnel. I'm, I'm not, you're not hearing me say that. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm making a suggestion. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. making a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's not part of the statutory responsibility, the panel. And I think the problem with that is just that myself. I'm not included in that. Everybody on that panel is working full time right. at another job and um, in diverse places. And uh, I think it would be difficult for the panel to be able to provide um, that level of. De I mean, certainly can provide um, contacts and you know people that the person should know and mm -hmm. meet with and right. talk to and that sort of thing. But um, I think. But the, yeah, okay. so we have the nuts and bolts with HR right. and with administration. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Think, I mean, I'm, obviously the governor will develop a relationship during the interview process <coughs> and all that, and and the governor will, you know, work with this individual, and then and then I think he will defer to the secretary to do as much as uh, she can do as well to, um, to you know, her her access to the secretary will be much greater than uh, the access to the governor at least. You know, during the legislative session, but, but I can find out a little bit more about that. What is the plan? <clears throat> would, it, would it be a good idea to um, perhaps, Karen, the, maybe have the panel sit down with the secretary, or maybe the panel sit yeah. down with the governor? I think that's what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I checked out for a couple of things. Yeah, I think I think we. Yeah, I've got the note to do exactly that to reach out to guys. Again, not to try to. 
insert ourselves, but I think there are members of the council that are also mm -hmm. very, very invested in wanting to see this person be very successful mm -hmm. in taking on these responsibilities and that we would love to individually and collectively um, reach out, welcome this person, mm -hmm. and do whatever we can to help with the onboarding orientation process. Mm -hmm. So I will personally volunteer myself and I'm happy to do so. Um, however, it would be helpful in terms of... Mm -hmm. I'd do the same. I mean, I, I think we, there's a lot of us who fought really hard, a lot of us sitting around this table fought really hard to make this happen in there, and we, you know, stand on the shoulders of a lot of other folks. Uh, so, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly do the same. I think one of the doable, workable things might be for maybe even also a meeting of the panel and the council sometime early in the year. So one of the first meetings of the council could be with the panel to talk yeah. about, you know, ideas around the onboarding and anything else, you know, whatever is coming up in today's conversations. So that, you know, it's, you know, more ideas the better. Not all of them might work or be doable, but, you know, everybody can be heard on that. That's a fabulous idea, DJ. Um, I know that it's also at a time when the panel's probably already feeling overwhelmed because you're already contemplating reviewing resumes and do you conduct interviews as well? Okay, and interviewing and all that stuff. So, but in your spare time. Right. <laughs> Is the, um, well, when, when would the next meeting of this Well, we haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. It yet. So that would be a later agenda. So maybe maybe not January. <laughs> It could be, it could be, we'll delay our first meeting until February just so that we can make it. I think that could be um, fine, yeah. Yeah. And they could be maybe back to back or overlapping a little bit so we yeah. could intersect and not take up all of each other's time, but yeah. Or, you know, if, it, if the meeting can happen together, I mean, Karen, you are the common point between the council and the panel, so. You know, if nothing else, if everybody can't meet, you're on both. Congratulations. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to add. No, but it's true. <laughs> She's retired. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't say it's working. It's <laughs> unraveling quickly, though. I've seen what you signed up for. So I, I have a, a just a budget question. Um, about this position and this work. Um, so it's being supported by the agency of administration and you're providing office space and all that, which is great. But then what about other expenses like travel, for instance? And is there a travel budget? Because I would, I would hope that this person will be visiting different parts of the state and not just staying in Montpelier all the time. There, there will be. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, in building the 2020 budget, um, you know, we had business managers working with DHR to try to establish a budget, an operating budget for, for this position. And that's being back charged to all of state governments. And, and you know, it's the best guess at this point, but it does include cost for travel and, and, and for operating budgets, uh, yeah. for office cost. Yeah, um, I don't know what the number is, uh, because nothing has been set yet as far as the budget comes. Uh, but I also know that, um, you know, that if it isn't sufficient, that um, you know we had some carry forward money in the secretary of administration's office that uh, would also be available to get through FY20 if we needed to. That gives us a better sense of what 21 needs to be. Right. So it's kind of a stopgap for the first year. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I don't think the budget will be an issue. Okay. You know. And in that in the FY2020 budget, you talked about that being you know charged back to yeah. the rest. Of, is that part of the 20? 20 budget. It's, part of the 20 it's not budget. waiting until 21, so that'll be. I, I believe it's 20. I and believe. then how is that um, getting? How is that showing up like in individual departments' budgets? It's it's, it's part. They uh, departments already get charged as as a for fund for DHR. <laughs> huh? so it's being added to the DHR charge, okay. and then gotcha. being put into the secretary's office to fund that position in the operating cost. Great. Yeah. There's a um, human resources service internal service fund. Service yeah. fund, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a fiscal year 2019. The statute calls for 1.65 chargeback for, for, for all departments in 2020. Uh, that is 3.3 percent chargeback. In, in addition to that, there's a $75,000 initial um, general fund that goes, and that obviously carries forward. <clears throat> Does 
anybody have any other questions for? Just a comment. I would emphasize that it would be good for the panel and Secretary Young to come up with not just a list of priorities, um, but also maybe deadlines for reports. Um, because if there's a deadline for a report, that there is kind of urgency in terms of getting, collecting data and information. Um, and um, if the panel, I don't know if the panel has discussed regular meetings um, or whether they are, they will convene whenever the executive director asks them to convene. So I'm thinking regular meetings would be a good way to have kind of that regular contact, being that you guys are also busy. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't really set a regular meeting um, time, but I think the, that what um, the panel's contemplating is that maybe we would have quarterly meetings yeah. or something along those lines. Um, and I like the idea of like a six month report or um, a one year report from the ED. Yeah. I, think the, I think the chair wanted to um, put into the ad actually that there would be quarterly reports to the panel, but um, the, that went beyond the statutory scope, so I think that's something that the panel will have to work out with the executive director. It just says periodic reports, yeah. so I think, but I think you're right, establishing deadlines for when those would be due would be helpful in making sure. And are those reports going to be open to the public? Oh, yeah. And what about a website for the panel where things um, like that could be posted and media Yeah, the DHR, I think, is um, setting up a website. Great. Um, so that we will be able to post our minutes and agendas and uh, meeting times and all those things. I think it was going to go through something in the governor's, the governor's boards for, I don't know, I didn't really understand what it was, but that somewhere in the governor's <coughs> office there is a website for various boards to report mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. or yeah, oh, there's, there's a share the, on the board commissions that he appoints somebody to. Mm -hmm. so he's going to appoint okay. me on this, so that would probably be right. part of that grouping okay. of the links. Yeah, so I think that's what they were talking about was at the website through there. Now, have you guys created a rubric for the like how to review the resumes and the interviews and so forth? Mm -hmm. okay. I would mm -hmm. just suggest mm -hmm. that on that rubric to include definitely uh, a part that that we really want to look for a person of color for this position. And I would really want to emphasize that. And so that could be part of the rubric, um, because I think that would be really important. <clears throat> there was a, um, some challenges that we spoke about in our last meeting about just uh, the feedback that I was getting from the general public on just the absence of information on the recruiting process. Everybody's flying in the dark out here. <clears throat> and uh, Tom, and Karen, I think you could probably appreciate this because I believe it was, okay, I'm just gonna out everybody now. So it was the, uh, the speaker's office, and I, I believe the other one may have been the governor's office because there was a selection that was actually, a um, uh, person refused the selection or something like that, but there were two uh, positions that were not filled. Um, but from the outside, you know, what it looks like is, is that, yeah, we've got this thing called Act 9, whatever that is, and um, there's going to be five separate entities that are filling them. We don't know which entity filled what position. We don't know how to contact any entity. We don't know if we want to apply for this position, who we can, who we even start with, right? We're completely blind. Nobody even knows, you know, so there's organizations like mine who are trying to inform folks uh, I think the speaker actually recommended to Secretary of Administration that they might just create a site for that purpose, right? Because this process is ongoing, ongoing rather. So what, what we'll want to do is, is, I mean, folk need to know what we know right now. There are folk across the, United, uh, across the state right now, they don't even know what we know. They don't know that there's a file, even though I know there's a press release that was sent out and so right. forth. But it didn't get picked up. And what's, you know, what's the next steps? What's going on you know, after that? And then once that person is hired, you know, so on and so on. Oh, maybe on that website, that announcement could exist. Hello, what a, you know, a novel idea. So I think that um, what we got to do now is just figure out you know, that uh, forward-facing presence for this function uh, in our community. 
So I have, have something to say about that. Um, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I think this is really important. And, mm -hmm. and I think for this council, it's important for us to be thinking about not just for this panel, but broadly about boards and commissions and appointments to those, sure, and about absolutely. getting diversity on those and, and getting the word out. Because right now, it, they're all facing similar kinds of, of obstacles. Absolutely. So there's this, um, the legislature created the Sunset Advisory Commission last spring right. that's designed to look at all of the commissions and all the boards and commissions and decide which ones need to be sunsetted uh, and some other things as well, but you know, to kind of like get that big picture look. And so they're looking at this question about how to uh, have a, a, a master list and to keep track of all of this. Mm -hmm. And they, this, this statute that was passed said that the Secretary of State needs to keep an inventory of this. And the Secretary of State is kind of coming back and saying it's actually a lot more complicated than you think and you haven't considered this, that, and the other thing. And, but one of the, the suggestions they've made is the state of Minnesota's Secretary of State's office has a model for, it's a website where all of the boards and commissions are, uh, openings are posted there. Uh, you can get links to information about all of them. You can look at all the membership. They include demographic data, so if you wanna see all of the people of color who are on all the panels and which ones, it's, it's set up really easy to do that, and they have staff to staff it. So, so this is sort of my little pitch on behalf of that because I looked at that and thought that would make our lives a lot easier and just you know make, make it better for everybody in Vermont, but the, there's gonna to need to be resources allocated to the Secretary of State's office to do that. Um, but it's a very good model, so if we want to, if we want to encourage movement on that, there's something in place that can be pointed to. Uh, and it might be worth us keeping it, you know, on our radar as we go forward as well. Sure, it, it, is, Jean, is Jeanette, is, is Senator White um, responsible for, for She's that? one of the co-chairs. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's also from Minnesota. Is she? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll help. Jennifer, <laughs> um, Peter Shumlin changed the Gubernatorial Boards and Commission's website it was based partially on Minnesota. Ah, oh, okay. Because uh, we've done the initial, um, he made that one of his campaign promises because before he didn't know who sat on, on the commissions, but now you've got the statutory, um, you have the, the, the statutes that are on, online already. Mm -hmm. You have uh, who's on the commission, but there's no designation in terms of whether or not they were appointed from you know, the Dairy Council or the governor. It, it's only the governor's appointment. It's, it's only, and, and there's no indication of that. So when you look at the list, it looks like there are, you know, like on our commission, we have 16 members, there are eight listed on his site, and you, if you just went there, you would think that the Commission on Women has only eight members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. I wonder Every how the administration has struggled. <coughs> There are it's a huge of job. Oh, it's commissions. Yeah. yeah, it's a complicated bit of business, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. But having it move from the governor's office to the secretary of state, I don't know. It might add another layer. But, but they, be a lot but I think it's indicative of how challenging it is because the yeah. secretary of state does a good job with his technology and does a good job with a lot of things technology-wise, and and even he's admitting that this is going to be a challenge. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it, it, you're right, each administration that I know of has, has tried and tried to improve that process. And um, some have, and others. It's hard for the governor to know who's, who's on all these commissions. He knows for certain who his appointees are. That's, that's what he knows. Yeah. It looks like it's, I'm sorry, can you? Well, just that at the Commission on Women, every couple of years we do um, a gender analysis of yeah. the members of all the boards and commissions, and so we, we know firsthand what it's like to go out and find everybody who's on there. Mm -hmm. We also know it can be done yeah. mm -hmm. in a busy agency that's doing a million other things mm -hmm. every couple of years. Um, the way we do it isn't really mm -hmm. sustainable or systemic, um, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to join forces with the Secretary of State's office if, where it ends up so mm -hmm. we can cut down on everybody's work and, and get some more mm -hmm. of that information. And it feels like we're having two, uh, two conversations to me uh, because um, in, on one hand, there should be this master list. <clears throat> but then again, once something is implemented, uh, or as it's being implemented, whoever owns it should own it, right? So for example, the, the Attorney General's office owns 
the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel, and they got a website, and they got all the minutes and all the agendas and all the yeah. meetings and all that other stuff. That, so it's a whole, there's two separate conversations yeah. here. So if the Secretary of Administration are on this, and then what they need to do is they need to embrace it and to be able to pull it in and to provide all of the data that's relevant to it and make it public, you know, so everybody can see it. That, so I think that's the delineation between the two conversations. For, the, that for that panel, do you go to the Attorney General's office and then to it, or well, or do you can you go directly? I know there's a website out there. How you get there, you know, bookmark is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all own our own boards and commissions. Right, yeah. Our state right. rehabilitation council, they have a website, they right. post their minutes, their right. membership, right. a yeah. whole nine yards. So I think that's a lot of work <laughs> over and above just right. keeping track of membership. Absolutely. I apologize, but I do have to leave. Um, thank so, you for coming. We are yeah, so grateful is, yeah, for thank your you presence so much. and your participation. Been, uh, this has been very impressive. Um, and um, starting off with just the, the, the committees that you reported on, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, everyone coming together and working, bringing your different skills here and uh, on top of your regular jobs. Uh, it's very impressive. Very impressive. And I've got a, a list of about nine or ten <laughs> <laughs> that, that I am taking back, seriously taking back, and we'll be chatting with Suzanne about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, you know the, the panel and, and Suzanne, Karen should be you know, thinking seriously about getting together here in the next, uh, you know, few weeks and, uh, and, and addressing some of the questions that came up today. So, thank you. Good. All right. Thank you again thank so you. much thank for you. attending thank today. You. Happy holidays. Thank you. <clears throat> so if there are no other questions of Karen or discussion about the um, the whole racial equity director process. Should we move on to yeah. our next, the next part, I guess, of agenda item? Really yeah, we're really going to talk in planning more, process. Yeah, and talk in more detail about some of the some things that we touched on a little bit in our committee update mm -hmm. section. But um, to, we we had identified several things on our agenda that we wanted to make sure we talked about in terms of what do we want to do in 2019 on these things. So maybe we just make our way through them? I think so. I think that's a good idea. So it would probably help if I, I'm going to just look over Karen's shoulder okay. since we're sharing an agenda, but she didn't know that. So. <laughs> There's a whole pile of agendas right up there. I know. <laughs> and I have it on my laptop too. But she can share. I, I'm, I'm nice. Yes. <laughs> it's a collaborative effort here. So it looks like some of these easily fall into continued work by the subcommittees that are already in there. And I guess we can go one by one or, <gasps> thank you. Now we're sharing. <laughs> yes, I got yes, it. and now I have my choice. I get it in stereo. <laughs> so, I mean, we've already talked a little bit about uh, section C and I don't know if we need to do anything other than to stay tuned and continue to offer up our support mm -hmm. and it may factor into what we decide for a meeting schedule um, if we want to try to time it so that we can help weigh in on the orientation process. Um, should we be going item by item or seeing if there are things that we completely missed? Well let's go item by item and then see if there's anything that we missed after that. So we have exit interviews first on our list. And we, Diane, we talked a bit about the exit interview process. And I, I updated that I talked to Chris McConnell, the Director of Field Operations at DHR, who is um, enthusiastic about helping us get a, a survey up and running and out to employees as they leave. So the question is going to be the, the specific information that we want on that survey. And our subcommittee can work on that. Or if people have thoughts right now, I think they would be great to hear um, for what can be added onto that. And we were talking about using the uh, the VTrans exit interview or uh, exit questionnaire yeah. as kind of a model, which asks things about just for those of you who haven't seen it, um, what reasons did you have for coming to work in state government in the first place and what reasons do you have for leaving and then some more nuanced questions about that but those are sort of the basic things so it doesn't include 
information about demographics or about you know race or disability or gender or age. I don't believe any of that was on there. I'm pretty sure not, but right. I mean, it wouldn't be that difficult since that's data that DHR has in the system. Um, Crystal's group could easily run a, a develop a, a query that um, in conjunction with the exit interview, if that was gonna be helpful, I don't know. Um, well, we don't have all of that data. Like, we don't track disability status. Like, there, there are certain things that we don't track. We track, like, EEO4 categories and, um, like, professional job category kind of stuff. But it's, it's fairly limited, I guess. We have race, we have gender, we have age. Um, not, I don't, do we report out on that? I don't know that we... So I don't know, but here's my, here's, in terms of, you know, this, this is just talking out loud. If we are going to track some of this information, I'm a little hesitant, especially in exit interviews with the demographics. You know, people are easily identifiable. If it's a smaller department, so if you are trying to correlate exit interview data to demographics, my concern is, is that it wouldn't elicit honest responses because if you're looking at a smaller department and you know um, minority employees leaving they could be easily identifiable so you might not get um, honest inputs that's how I feel mm -hmm. I guess I'm I, I was talking about the fact that we know the demographics and it's already being tracked by Doug Pine and it's part of the workforce report. Yeah, we, we report on the so, workforce report. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if the survey is anonymous, then we don't know. We yeah. won't be able to you exactly. know, look them so up. Exactly. So yeah. what I'm trying to say is trying to link exit interview data with demographics. Doing exit interviews is a great idea. What are we looking at? I understand that we might want to look at the demographics to see why people are leaving, but if we try to relate that data, the demographics, with the exit interviews, there is not going to be too much anon anonymity for certain groups of people. It's well, we do exit interviews, and we have a contractor who calls people, and it's not anonymous. Right. And that Our information to be comes either. to only me and my field operations manager. So my, again, not knowing how, how exit so it's you know exit interviews aren't done by all departments and all agencies, um, as far as I understand. Um, so, you know, let me ask you a question. So, do you find do you get information on who provided the specific information, or is there scope for anonymity? So here's the piece: if a survey is going out to people who've left. Is there an option of not, pro it's like the employees, you know, employee engagement survey, right? There is a comment section. If I wanted to, I could add my name in there. Mm -hmm. It's up to me completely. But if I didn't want to, I wouldn't. So is there still, you know, so those are some of the things I think we need to talk through in terms of if we are looking at linking demographics to exit interviews. I guess people are leaving us. So they're much more inclined to be really honest <laughs> about their experience, good, bad, or otherwise. It, it really depends. I would think that you know it depends on who you are, mm -hmm. which department you work for, and how comfortable you might be sharing that information. Mm -hmm. So completely understand your point. Mm -hmm. You might be comfortable. Somebody else might be comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody else is going to feel that comfort. Mm -hmm. It may depend also on where they are in their career. Exactly. Because they may yeah. know that they could be coming back to the state yes, at some absolutely. point. And, and yeah. people have, because people struggle with participating in the engagement survey too, because everybody's worried that anything they say, everyone all of a sudden in the entire state is going to know that they said it. So people have this weird assumption that, you know, if they report something in an exit interview, everyone might know that they said it, even if they're applying in a different agency three years later, you know. So there, there is some hesitation. Um, I am wondering, though, if we do have a coordinated initiative to increase participation in the exit interviews, if we'll get better data 
from more people and that will complement the workforce data that we have and might help us spot more of those trends than we can right now. It, it seems to me that if you did the exits um, interview survey in a way that doesn't tie the individual to whatever agency or department they worked for, right, then you, then you can get the demographic, demographic information because then you're not that person becomes less personally identifiable. Yes, absolutely. That um, might be workable, but right. then, you know, it and depends then, on, here's the piece, right? Before we get into this, we need to figure out what is it that we want to do with this data. Right. Right. Here's the piece, like if you're gathering demographic information, for example, across state government, right. without trying to figure out which agency or which department, how, you know, what are the action items for X department versus Z department, then that sounds like a great idea. But if the, the intent is to look at pockets mm -hmm. where you know there are more issues as compared to pockets where there are lesser issues, right. then that might not be so right. which but, is but I think it then then you can I mean I think you could when you're reporting it out, right, you can report it out without that information, but that information could be coming to somebody who's looking at that piece of it. So like the Agency of Education, for example, collects data on students that is um, where students can be personally identified within a school district. They get the data, right? And so they can analyze the data and see what districts may be having a problem with this, that, or the other thing. But the district itself isn't necessarily going to know that you know, it's coming because of a particular set of data that the agency is looking at. I mean, I, ways of like separating that out so you can still use the information. Because if we don't get the information about race, for example, then how are we going to get any information out of that that's going to tell, help tell us why people are leaving at twice the rate, right? Because then we just got a whole bunch of data that tells us that this many people left and we have no idea whether they're in that cohort or they're not. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's just I you know, want to ensure that we realize that there are, mm -hmm. you know, there are two aspects of it. I mean, you know, we got you know, we might want to go ahead and do this this way and let people know that, you know, this this information wouldn't be shared. It's still the comfort level of the person on the other side right. who's completing that exit right. interview. Absolutely. So, you know, we still may not actually then get the relevant information that we're looking for because yeah. people might, you know, it's like I'm gonna be easily identifiable. Yeah. I'm not gonna participate in it. <clears throat> um, so we have to balance yeah. all of those factors when yeah, could you could you, sure. could you make the um, could you make it optional? Like could you make some of the questions optional? so that some people could choose to answer the demographics yeah. question and some people could choose not to. Or um, I do like the idea that, I, I would think that the goal really here is to identify who is leaving and why they're leaving at, across the board. And then we already have information out there about retention at different departments, right? So like we know that DOC doesn't retain a lot of people. We know that already. So maybe we don't need this information to focus on department by department and comparing and who's doing great and who's not doing great. Maybe our goal really is just to figure out who is leaving across the board and why and like what, you know, I mean ideally like trying to figure out is do people with disabilities leave and why and do people who are persons of color, men, women, etc. So I like the idea of collecting the demographics, but we could also make that optional, and then also not connecting it to the office, because you're absolutely right. Like at Dale and AOT, you're huge, right? But at the HRC, <laughs> if you're Asian and you leave, we know who you are, <laughs> right? It's true. Yes. Yes. it's true, it's true, but even still, I mean, so at AOT, you know, I have made a point of inviting any of our, I'll use with quotes around it, non-traditional, employees, so non-traditional, could be people of color, it could be women that are performing um, in non-traditional careers, it could be people that are um, people with disabilities, but I almost always reach out and invite them to sit down with me, whether or not they're also having an exit interview with HR 
face-to-face um, -face or a survey. And ideally, I've already got a working relationship with this person since um, my group is the one who's out there doing a lot of the recruitment. I sit on hiring panels. I'm part of the new employee welcome. So this isn't like them sitting down with a brand new person and feeling like they have to share things that they're not comfortable with. But it's a totally voluntary thing. And my big concern is always to identify if why they're, why they're leaving and whether or not it has to do with the fact that we're not making people feel welcome um, or we're singling people out or they're feeling like they're the one and only and what we can do better about all of that. And that's a discussion that's a little bit off of the script and it's not going to be the same exit interview type questions, although I am gonna try to touch on all those things and I definitely don't wanna try to plant seeds or to, um, try to influence people in terms of what they decide to share. But, you know, I'll give you a, an example. We had a succession of, um, so these were our wins. We um, kept hiring engineers in our contract admin section that were not only people of color, but were also not native um, uh, to, that they were new Americans. And they were coming on board and bringing a lot of great skills and qualities and unfortunately I also saw this churn and in some cases they were even the supervisors and for whatever reason um, they were not staying and that was a huge concern for me because I wanted to make sure that after a while it starts to it doesn't look like a coincidence anymore right and so I really did want to try to explore this and and the reality is that I got some wonderful feedback and information in the course of having sit-downs with people. And it could just be over a cup of coffee and not a formal exit interview per se. But I really need to know so that we can uh, try to figure out what we can do differently in terms of um, changing our culture and welcoming people. And, and with, um, without exception, all three of these engineers who had come and then unfortunately left, all left to move to big cities. And Vermont just wasn't cutting it, and especially in Montpelier, Vermont. And um, what was remarkable to me was, in many cases, they were talking about how what great relationships they had built in the short time they had been there with many of our other engineers and the other staff and contract admin, and that they were these were going to be lifelong friendships. And so I don't think they were just telling me that to make me feel better, but. That was important information instead of me just like looking at statistics and data and going, uh-oh, we got a big problem here, right? Because we do have a big problem in that it's hard for us to um, attract people who are going to feel comfortable in a small, rural, very uh, white state like Vermont. But it's not necessarily because we are making people explicitly feel uncomfortable in our work environment. So when we did our study with uh, UVM, um, the takeaways were that the reason people were deciding to leave um, overwhelmingly did have to do with things in our culture, and some of that was favoritism, and it was also a lot of uh, 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 dissatisfaction with the quality of supervision. and. That seems to be across the board. That's not just unique to our agency. And I'm not sure how that impacts and whether it impacts people of color more than it does for our white employees. Well, I just have to say that the notion of an exit interview feels like sort of incomplete data. You're, you're only tapping those individuals who are leaving. So I wonder if you augment that with some kind of focus groups or talking to individuals who are still in the workforce. Because you may very well hear from some people I'm actually feeling very supportive, and I, I feel that I, I'm, I'm in a good place here. And you want to hear from those folks as much as you want to hear from folks who are leaving. So I just wonder if exit interviews are part of an overall strategy to, to gather information from workers, including incumbent workers, who are still in the workforce. And before you got here, I was talking about how we're just starting to do stay interviews and to be able to develop not just a series of questions, but also some cheat sheets and pointers for our supervisors to be having sit downs with employees to find out what's working and what, what we can do better yeah. instead. Because so. you know, sometimes you fall into the trap of assuming that all is, is not working, when in fact there may be elements that are working very well. We want to make sure that we're expanding and replicating those. Right. So 
if, if we take your example of those engineers, yep. um, and the whole body of engineers who've left black, white, whatever, gender, um, is there a common theme around Montpelier is just too small and they move for a larger city? Is that a function of race or is it a function of age? Where you know younger people might want to have more options? Well, we have been losing people to the fact that we're in central Vermont versus, let's say, Burlington area, where a lot of the consulting firms that we work with, and we lose them to the consulting firms for a lot of reasons, including the location as well as the pay. So, um, I don't know whether or not it's, um, that any of it is race-based or not. I really don't. Well, and people leave for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea that anybody is leaving for one reason is not, True, like people leave for economics plus lack of diversity, mm -hmm. plus lack of inclusion, plus lack of supervision. And so our goal, I think, as a council is to capture why the, the inclusion piece of it, right? Because we can't necessarily fix the economics. I wish we could, because that would fix a lot of the diversity piece too, I think. Mm -hmm. But if we, we, we want to capture what, the inclusion piece of it. Great. And then I just want to respond to that to the, the, what you mentioned about favoritism yeah. that people are complaining about. I absolutely think favoritism is related to race. <coughs> because I think we don't have diversity here. And we have, we know there's implicit bias. We know people know each other. So when, when employees complain about favoritism, I mean, I think you have to like dig deeper to see if there is race behind that. Um, and also it could, even the perception of that is as important as it actually being favoritism or not. I think favoritism is code for sometimes an old boy network, yeah. right? Yeah. And right. that's how I interpret it when people identify favoritism as a reason for leaving. Mm -hmm. At least for our agency, since we're heavily male dominated. So. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. that we can at least move forward with exit interviews. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so, you know, nothing is cast in concrete if we can come up with something and figure it out and try it and improve it over time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So just a question, sorry. Um, it sounds like you were talking about the exit surveys rather yes. than interviews. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, right. again, going back to the distinction of interviews, mm -hmm. you know, face-to-face -face where they know you and they've worked with you is, again, completely different than a survey which is going to gather data and there's going to be some kind of analysis on it. And again, not, I don't want to, you know, sound like a broken record, but to your point, great that you got that feedback, but you got that probably because it was positive feedback, right? Or they were leaving. Well, I've got lots of the negative feedback too. I was just giving in, in those examples where I was seeing a trend that was alarming to me. Um, I'm, I'm not, but I have sat down with some of our people of color who um, cycled through pretty quickly, and I've been told flat out okay. oh, right. that okay. they felt That's... like they were being treated very differently, okay. and uh, as a, because of their race. Okay. So that... I've gotten both. Okay, you've gotten both. Okay. Yeah. From what I was hearing, I felt like you know, you know, okay. people would be more comfortable sharing more positive feedback rather than negative. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if you had received that or not. So thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And again, you're the mm -hmm. diversity person mm -hmm. working right. at the AOT. Mm -hmm. You're not the supervisor who Absolutely. they are mm -hmm. right. working with directly. Right. And so that person isn't going to get that kind of honest feedback because that person is going to be the reference mm -hmm. in the future or so forth. Mm -hmm. But yeah. to yeah. going to your point, like yeah. small department, right? right? You right. know, leaving from HRC. Right. I mean, not that I'm looking at leaving, nor that I have any concerns or issues, but you know, even within the HR, right? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so from that perspective, I think we just need to keep that in mind. So it's a really important point, and and it's clear, and we're always counseling people, don't burn your bridges, right? And that people have to not necessarily leave like under a cloud or um, 
But I do think that the only way that we're going to be able to, and you may have already said it, Karen, or somebody said it, it was the end. Um, we can collect all of this data about why people are leaving, but if we don't figure out a way, like Ford was suggesting, maybe an optional category for collecting the demographics, then we're never going to know which aspects are influencing the numbers, because we do know that people of color are leaving at a much higher rate than white people. Well, what's the problem with leading with that with these interviews? Yeah. I think if you are doing an exit survey or interview or whatever, and you say, you know, what's your reason for leaving? Everybody's automatically going to think, like, I don't want to burn any bridges here. But if you opened it at the, with a prologue to the survey or in the interview and said, look, uh, you know, I want you to know why we're doing this. We recognize that people of color are leaving at twice the rate as everybody else, as the general population, and we want to do better at that. And if you know anything that would help us be better at that, we would really appreciate hearing that from you so that it signals to the person that this is, there's somebody listening with open ears, and this is something that really could benefit, and I think that could yeah. make all the difference. Yeah. But can we clarify, too, that exit interviews serve what purpose? Is it for the department to learn? Do they report that they're, they're, they did an exit interview? Who do they report that to? Like, Or is that just like, if I do an exit interview, that's for my own record, for my own purpose? Yeah, I well, it depends. Well, it does. The difference between a survey and an right. interview. Right. Yeah. What I'm understanding about the survey is that it goes into a common pool and information is not disaggregated so that supervisors or in the departments can know what the trends are of folks that are leaving. And for that reason alone, I would include demographic data on the survey as well as um, having that go back to the department. Um, yeah. So you don't want that because you, you, I, the idea that there's a general big report about why people are living at the state is good, but giving each department information about what, what's happening there mm -hmm. is burning those bridges. Then right. how will those departments improve their performance? I right, I understand, so, and I that this is the conundrum, right? That this is the conundrum because you're not going to get an honest answer. Vermont is so small; you're not going to get an honest answer from why Moore has left the Vermont Human Rights Commission because. I mean, I happen to be the boss now, but if I, right? but if I were, my one and only boss is my reference. I know nobody else in the state of Vermont. So you don't want information from the survey necessarily to come back to the department because that's the thing that it will scare people off from telling the truth. This so, is the dilemma. So right? actually, then trying to, I mean, having listened to kind of, I'm just thinking, right? Here's the question first is, what are we going to do with the data? What is it for? Right. So if so, exit interviews happen. Different departments do it. Some departments don't do it. That's a specific tool for themselves. That's a face-to-face -face conversation that people like you are in the field are having with their employees. But looking at it from the perspective of this council supporting the um, executive director, I actually like your idea. Some of the things that you were saying having the data be collected across state government, you know, and be available so that the executive director actually has that data, and the executive director actually has the data available for department specific. It doesn't go anywhere else. So the director then is able to look at those trends and analyze and work with individual departments without those departments knowing how and where it came from specifically. I mean, that's trying to make yeah. the best I think of if, if right. the concern is whether people are going to be honest in their answers, it doesn't really matter whether that information goes back to departments or doesn't or appears in some big report or doesn't because I, as the former employee filling it out, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I just know that I'm putting my information out there and it might make me identifiable. And I'm, if I'm going to be scared, or if I'm going to you know, be reluctant to be honest, then I'm going to be reluctant to be honest, whatever we do with it. So, but if we make the, all of the questions optional, 
then some people just won't fill it out at all, and that's always going to happen. Some people will fill every little bit of it out. Some people will fill it out except for the department that they left or whatever they think is identifying. And so we won't necessarily get, we won't get 100% complete information from every single person that we send it to, but we'll get a lot mm -hmm. of really good information that we can then use in various ways. If we want to go down to the department level in our analysis, we can. Um, I think, but we don't have to if we decide that's not useful. Um, so that's kind of where I would lean, is just yeah, was, put it all on there and make it all optional. Right, I was just kind of thinking if you, for example, if um, one of the thing, pieces of feedback that you get from people who identify as a person of color in those exit interviews is, I didn't feel like I had anybody that I could go to who was supporting me, right? Then you might be able to, on a statewide basis, say, you know, people need a, a buddy, people need a mentor, and they need an assigned mentor, and we especially want, this will happen anytime you hire somebody who is in any kind of protected status. They will be assigned a mentor who will be expected to work with them so that you can use that data in a larger kind of context without having to necessarily go and say, well, the, you know, this department's having a particular problem with that. Um, so there might be ways of doing it um, from there as well. There might also way be up. ways of trying to elicit from people their perceptions of whether we have an inclusive, welcoming culture that provides uh, equal employment opportunities um, and does so in a non-discriminatory way without necessarily like saying to somebody is the reason why you left X, Y, or Z, or just using codes like <clears throat> favoritism, organization and culture, and stuff like that. I don't think it would be that hard for us without trying to like plant the seeds of doubt or, um, or try to influence people's answers mm -hmm. to get them to reflect on the things that they, um, that they um, perceived and experienced and observed while they were employed by us, and whether or not that influenced their decision to leave. And that shouldn't be that hard to even, I don't know, tweak some of the questions that ended up in our exit survey questionnaire. So, uh, Dory, if, if I could please, the, sure. I just want to pull a couple things together that I've heard because it sounds like Obviously, there has been a lot of discussion, for, you know, historically within this group about uh, the whole idea of exit interviews, and um, it sounds like one of the things that has been driving that is is the, um, I guess, it's the times two turnover rate of people of color, which is usually a, an indicator of other problems because there's, you know, I'm sure there are turnover rates that are high, maybe not as high, of other demographics that are vulnerable, <clears throat> and I think that. Um, the exit interviews, um, I mean, sure, they're, they're, for that purpose, I think they're, they're good, and I think everybody would agree they're good for other purposes, for, for management, for administrative purposes, to, you know, to make things better, internal processes. But if this is a data discussion, uh, it, it, it seems like um, there should be multiple points of data, you know, leading all the way back to the point of entry, uh, where a person, when they come into the, the employment with the state, we should know that the unemployment rate is two times higher for people of color. And they should know that the dismissal rate inside of the state is twice as high as for, for, the, for those who are black as well, okay? For, at the inception of that relationship, okay? And throughout um, various um, review periods, I, I, I know the state does reviews on a periodic basis they've got to, I would imagine, maybe I'm just being altruistic. No. But, the, but the thing is, is that during those, 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 period, those periods, you know, maybe it's a 360 or something like that, but there's gotta be, at some point or another, say, hey, you know, an opportunity to gather, to get a data point here, to get a data point there, and so forth. So I, I think that the, the exit interview should just be a culmination of, of, of a series of data points where information was collected and, and, and disseminated um, with this particular employee. Uh, and the survey is simply a tool that would augment that process. They're not two different things. The survey, in my opinion, it's, it's, it would seem as though it would, be, it would be a tool that 
could be selectively chosen, maybe not always, but maybe to say, yeah, this person seems, after having a conversation with this person, it seems like it's a good idea to give this person a survey, besides they asked me, or whatever, you know? So the whole data collection piece, I think it, it really goes back to one thing is, is what do we want to find out? And I think that the, co the committee on data, or whoever is, has this responsibility to determine this whole thing about exit interviews, not surveys, um, should make that determination and come back with some kind of recommendation and say, this is what we're really trying to learn. Um, otherwise, we, I think we can kick this for the rest of the afternoon. Speaking of having different points of asking those questions, mm -hmm. I think we had talked at one point about adding a few questions to the employee engagement survey. I mean, I would think that we use that thought mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah. So let's get that back on the yeah. bullet. Yeah. Okay. Again. Absolutely. And then I oh, I've said this many times, and I need to, and I actually identified somebody and never reached out. But we should have a member of uh, Invest EAP on this council. I think. Uh -huh. uh, we provide EAP services for state employees, and I'm betting that they hear this stuff, right? Um, so uh, we can identify somebody from that program to join if that's, I see nodding heads. Does that seem like a good idea? Yeah, so I mean, since Myra has retired, um, I think Bobby's taken over and he might be available and willing to join the group. Bobby um, Arnell? Yeah. He's a possibility. I was thinking more about a clinician who okay. is seeing people and hearing these things more directly, but I'll talk Do with Do you Steve. have anybody in particular that you're thinking about? Steve Dickens, who's the program manager, had recommended somebody, and I honestly am blank on who it was, but I can talk to Steve and sort of have that conversation with him. It's a great it is a great idea. idea. To the next meeting. And one note about. I'll go back to the okay. fundamental reason why we collect data. We don't collect data to simply to collect data. We collect data to improve the delivery of services. Mm -hmm. And if there's no way to attach that data with the person or department that's delivering the services, then collecting data is. is a waste of time and energy. Yeah. Well, you're balancing act, is seeking out and getting accurate data with the need to improve each department level. And so you're, it, that's the balancing act here, which is wanting to get as accurate as possible as data that we need versus the ability to give to each department the information that they need. And so that is, it, it, it is difficult. And I'm not saying that one is more right than the other. But in a state that is mostly white, mm -hmm. it is so important for people of color to have anonymity mm -hmm. when they are saying, I am leaving partly because of this. And so I'm also like, if we gave all the information to one person, the, e, the new ED or someone in HR, but that information was, but we shared with the people that were, the, the employees that have left, that this information isn't going back to your department. Mm -hmm. That that would give us that guarantee, and yet there would still be the ability for someone at HR or the new ED to know that this is the department that needs more help, or that this is the department that doesn't. But that we don't necessarily need to provide that information back to each department. So I'm not opposed to necessarily co connecting it to the department. What I'm opposed to is the department receiving that information because then then the accuracy of the information you're getting is just not gonna, you're not gonna get it. So, so the other thing we have to yeah. keep in mind, because I, and I, I agree with you, I think, and with Aditi, it could be done that way and then have, but I would argue that we want the executive director to have it, not HR. Because sure, okay, HR, well, yeah. Just HR has yeah. its own ability to yeah. impose and, and itself. Going, uh, and going to your point, <coughs> the connecting piece too, right? I mean, it's like you would, so again, just thinking through conceptually is you would connect that data back to a specific department only if it was like a trend 
right. or you know something mm -hmm. which is it wouldn't be like one off right. situation where there's you know a specific concern it might just be that one off situation or like somebody mm -hmm. leaving because they just want to move to a bigger city as an example but it's if it starts going into a trend, that is where it could be <laughs> summarized by the executive director and they could work with that specific right. department for an action plan or strategies without mm -hmm. linking it back to the specifics. So the other well, but given, given the geographic dis, uh, distribution of folks of color in state government, you're gonna know. Right. And, and then the question becomes, when the ED, looking at the trend line, decides that this department needs some sort of intervention, that department head's going to be scratching his or her head and saying, well, why us? And why not Department X or Department Y? Assuming that, you know, going to both lines is that, you know, we are the executive director, you know, depending on how the outcome of the data group is going to be, it's going to be data points at different different times. Mm -hmm. It's not just the exit survey. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that the executive director will work on mm -hmm. data that is coming in from various other, um, mm -hmm. you know, data sets, points, wherever mm -hmm. in the employees tenure mm -hmm. with that department. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if the exit interview is giving specific information, that specific information is probably going to come from other mm -hmm. places as well within that department. So then it becomes difficult, right, for a department to be able to connect it to employee X who left two years ago. But let me kind of agree with what you're saying, except for, I think we're talking about things on another layer of abstraction, because um, first of all, as far as you know, anonymity, I'd rather have justice, quite frankly, okay? I don't really, I don't really care to be hidden if it's gonna cost me um, justice. So, so, I don't, so let, let's just you know, table that for a minute, because what I'm, what I'm getting at here is, is that the other abstraction is, is race data collection from a whole other level, and that has to do with Let's just use the best example we have in the state. This is our police. Title 202366. Did you stop them? Did you search them? Did you, did, did you cite them? Did you give them a ticket? Did you arrest them? Um, so all of those data points, if you will, will are very are highly critical decisions that are, are, are where, where discretion is provided. Discretion is a huge word is provided for this particular uh, law enforcement officer. And all that information is aggregated, it's correlated, um, it's, you know, the, the, the uh, presentation lab level is there. Um, and I think there's also a compartmentalization component of the data as it's presented to provide its specific use to a specific persons, okay? Because inside, from admin, for administrative and training purposes, the data could be used for one purpose, whereas for us on the outside, it may be used just to present to us that there are racial disparities. So I guess what I'm getting at here is, is that you can you can you can use the data. The data can be used for administrative and training purposes internally, as well as being presented for other purposes to prove dis disparities. It's not so much to prove disparities. That's really important to to show progress towards parity. Okay, um, it can be it can happen at the same time. Same data set. The compartmentalization is the key here. So just if you, if I may, going back to your earlier point mm -hmm. about the, you know, justice is more important than anonymity. Mm -hmm. What I think, I'm, what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is not that I, what we should be providing someone who's giving that information anonymity. Should what I'm trying to say is that the person might want to remain anonymous mm -hmm. and hence wouldn't actually provide the information that we are looking for. I agree. So, which is why it's a thin balance. I mean, you know, for somebody, it might be so important that, you know, um, I'm going to share all this information about my negative experiences. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'm moving to California. It's their choice, though. Yes, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, somebody might think, I, I'm going to continue living in the state of Vermont, and I might want to go back working for the state of Vermont. Right. And that's why I choose not to share my experiences 
because I would be easily identifiable, which is why I'm saying it's, you know, I'm not opposed to the idea. Sure. What I'm saying is that we need to take that into account I from understand. the person's perspective. So and I think we need to be able to give them both mm -hmm. at the end of the yeah, day, with really that compartmentalization. Yes, exactly. yeah. So one other thing I would add to that whole conversation is we would have to figure out what the public records issue is with that, right? Mm -hmm. So if the data is actually being collected and it's identifying departments, but we're saying, well, we're only going to give that to the executive yeah, director true. of the racial mm -hmm. equity panel, um, we may or may not be able to do that in, in the sense of, of saying, this, this is off limits to the general public who might want to know which departments are doing what. Because um, I don't that's think once you really collect it, it's it's public yeah. record. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the other piece. Which, that we which is probably going to apply to a lot of the work that the yeah. executive director is doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think what we'd envision with the executive director is, is you know, a model that's similar to the one I just explained with the police. Mm -hmm. this is, you know, what are the two or three major um, data points within your business process, whatever your business is across the state, where there's a high level of discretion and the impact of those decisions are huge. Right, right. So it could be it's the the decision at six months whether mm -hmm. to retain the person sure. or whether to put them on probation. Absolutely. Or, yeah, or move them forward. Um, mm -hmm. That's certainly that's a definitely discretion valid. point. Right. It's a huge discretion point. And what's the race, you know, what's the race demographics of the data with, right. with that particular data point? Then there are others, you right. know, you know, who, who decides right. whether it's per who, person who gets or discipline. Performance and blueprint plans and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So collecting those data points and, and creating um, breakouts for race demographics in those data points mm -hmm. and then analyzing those data points on a recurring basis and moving forward, that's what we envision for this particular uh, director, that type of work. It's a lot of work because this, you know, it's, it's a huge state. Well, not huge. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is that, the, the, the thing is, is that there, even the collection of that data would be compartmentalized because at the end of the day, we would want the outcome of that to be made public, right? We would want the roll up of that to be made public. Whereas when you start getting down to the the individuals who make those decisions on a regular basis, just like we do with law enforcement, we have that data. It's just not public. You don't know who made those decisions. We have the data down with the state police down to the point to where we can look at an individual officer and the decisions that they made, race-based race decisions that they made on very critical decisions over years, but it's not, it's not publicly available. So how do you have it? I don't. It, oh. it's, it's internal data to the state gotcha. police. I don't have, I would never have it. So I'm conscious of time. This That's has been a great correct. discussion. And I think it's touched on actually a lot of, of different aspects of our work, not just this one particular question about surveys, which is great. But um, maybe we should move on. Okay. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think is that all right with everybody? We've given the data committee lots of things to do. Yes. Yes. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So the next item um, seems like it's something we already touched on when we were reporting out on the 2018 work, and this has to do with the implicit bias training. Um, there's a, already a lot in the pipeline on that one since we've got the new employee onboarding training for state government, and that has included um, both implicit bias training as well as the uh, preventing and addressing sexual harassment training. And the pilot started, the trains left the station. One of the things that the subcommittee from this council had specifically asked of CAPS was an opportunity to come in and either preview or observe some of the training as it gets developed and delivered in order to be able to provide ongoing feedback and stuff. So I didn't know to what extent members of the committee wanted to partake of that now that they have overhauled the preventing and addressing sexual harassment and they have it in a pilot model. Um, and I think that I'm very pleased at how many of our suggestions were incorporated in there, but it would be great to see it in action. So um, that's one thing that I think we might want to be doing is setting up times either individually or as a group again to go and sit in on the training 
And I'm also totally open, so I know that AHS and AOT are also going to start delivering very similar training to our new employees um, starting in 2019. And we've been given the flexibility to be able to tweak the training so that it's a very similar um, curriculum, but can be a little bit agency specific. Um, so. And my understanding and what was proposed to Carrie that she was receptive to was not just implicit bias training, but any diversity related, correct? Any new That's my that understanding. might touch on this also, so. Yeah, so, and I don't know what she has in the pipeline in terms of what she's planning to offer through CAPS, either with her trainers or with outsourced trainers that's going to be in this realm, but maybe it would be good for the subcommittee to have some kind of regular meetings with her, or at least a check-in meeting early in the year to see what, what's in the pipeline and we can sort stuff out. So Lori, just point of clarification, is the, is the pilot that started including sexual harassment yes. and implicit bias, or it's just the tweet sexual no, harassment? It's, both, I believe. Um, so it's the four hours of training that the Secretary's administration, I think, is going to be mandating for all new employees starting in 2019. It was originally going to be in early 2019, then it was going to be like in the late winter. Now I hear it's going to be May or June that it's going to become effective. But the pilot is for three or four or five departments that are participating, and I believe it's all four hours of training. So we provided our entire slide deck as well as our handouts and everything from a workplace civility slash implicit bias training that we provided to DHR this past June. And we've continued to tweak ours for our own workforce. Um, and I, I don't know what the schedule looks like right now, but I know that the train left the station, right? And Joe, you said that you had some employee, new employees who attended recently? Right, that had just taken it and, and noted. You know, when I sat down afterwards and went through our feedback, they said most of that was incorporated, which I was really happy to hear. Yeah, I think we just started last week. Was that the one that was in Waterbury? Was that the training that was in Waterbury for the entire state? I think Christine said she was there. That's where it was last week. Oh, okay. I was talking about the pilot part of okay. the, the onboarding intention. I don't know if that, could, yeah, but just implementing that with the pilot departments. Mm -hmm. above. The HR is one of them, you said. The right? HR, the tax, mm -hmm. and labor. Yeah. Sounds right. So maybe our goal for 2019 is to have the council um, have an opportunity to review the training, both the curriculum as well as the delivery, and um, and provide feedback, and also identify what other training is in the works, mm -hmm. either through CAPS or other state agencies and departments, continue with the work that we had talked about doing of creating a fairly comprehensive inventory of training that's being offered throughout state government and maybe also a list of trainers that are being used so that we know what's out there. I'm also very open if any council members want to attend the training that we're starting to roll out to our workforce, just let me know. So we start this Friday. We have two more sessions next Wednesday, and then we have four sessions in the first two weeks of January. And I'm happy to share our training schedule. And if you don't mind sharing, please. Absolutely. So, and all of our training is right now at least being delivered um, at our training center on the very Montpelier Road. And some of it will definitely be another road show like we did with. Uh, DMV 2017. We already have our construction section that we're going to go to regional offices and stuff. So 
for any council members who are, I don't think too many of us are in other locations in other parts of the state. And this Eastern. is the implicit bias or is it? It's both. Okay. So it's a three hour training that really weaves together um, implicit bias and, uh, and workplace civility. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else that the training group wants to tackle? Are there plans in 2019 uh, to address the uh, requirements, the training requirements that are laid out in, in Act 9? So that wouldn't necessarily be in our purview other than the fact that we could definitely work with the executive director and make available resources and recommendations, but I'm sorry, I was really I, more directed it towards the folks that represent the HR uh, organization oh. because that, I think that that is who was tasked with that. I think it was the it was uh, the racial equity director in conjunction with HR was it not here? Yeah. I think that you're right, and I don't. There's nobody from CAPS as a training over here, but I would think that would be once the executive director. Is in place, they would work okay. with them. But yeah, I presumably if they'll want that person will want some data and information exactly. before making a training recommendation. I don't think mm -hmm. we'd want to make a recommendation on their behalf before they've had a chance to. No, I think my question was more around whether or not there were plans on your calendar in 2019 to um, to have that activity as action items for the year to to set to to plan in conjunction with the racial equity director the uh, the training framework that would be. Coming. Yeah, and that would be a, probably a question for the oh, CAPS director, yeah, Carrie Miner. Yeah. Right. I don't want to recycle something we already talked about, but Diane, you had mentioned something about questions for the engagement survey. I just want to note that now would probably be the time to propose suggestions if you did want DHR to consider adding or modifying any questions or content of the survey because that will be launching, I think, in late February, early March this okay. year. Okay. Is the survey available for viewing online? Uh, there is a summary of um, the engagement survey of responses from the last time it was administered available. I think historically going back several years as yeah, well on the Human Resources workforce. website. Traditionally, it's been part of the workforce report, so it's usually at the end of the workforce report. This year, it's separated. It's not going to be part of the workforce report, but I believe it's going to still be published online. When, when it's completed. It's going, it's going to be a little later, like Val had said, not like it said. But. Yeah, it had been administered in the fall for several years right. running. This year they decided to postpone till the spring, so. And it's for the workforce as a whole, although there are parts of it that identify broken out by department. Yeah. Department yeah. division, yeah. yeah. So. Which is new. Yeah. Last year. So should we move on to the um, recruitment and retention of the committee? Yeah. <laughs> so who else is on your subcommittee? So and Dana, Dana and, and Casey. Oh, and Casey. And Tom. So. Well, he conveniently left. Yeah, he had to. So, but I think that also you have certainly members of the council that are here that are interested and that you partner with too on some of these things. So, sure. Um, and I'm looking at you and Diane especially. Yeah, I mean obviously work my goal. CWS. Yeah, exactly. But to keep on going with the great work, the great partnership of CWS, they've been, you know, uh, you know, I think we work together really well. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I get it's gotten to the point now where I get uh, you know, directly uh, contacted by some of the some of the you know, you. business account managers or you know uh, employment uh, consultants. consultants. Thank you. <laughs> you know directly now because we've been able to have so many contacts and that <clears throat> you guys have been able to kind of connect me with. So that they feel comfortable enough now that you just go directly to me and say, hey, you know, I have a per I have a client and they're interested in this area. Can you, you know, is there something you can, um, you know, some. But you can set them up with for an informational interview yeah. or a mock interview, um, doing a, a, you know, a shadowing, job shadowing, things like that. So we certainly want to continue there. Um, I definitely want, you know, one of the things, you know, 
we're, we're looking to do is you know, be much more, um, <clears throat> up, you know, improve our diversity and inclusion recruiting. Um, I would love input, you know, from the community to see like how best we can do that, how we can target, we can, we can improve our strategy, our recruitment strategy there. Um, you know, that, that's definitely uh, something that's on our radar, improving um, our system, making it accessible to everybody. Um, the, uh, the new system, Success Factors, is out of the box, has, is by the way compliant, you know, accessible uh, relation, in relation to the American with, Dis American with Disability Act. So that was a huge, um, that's a huge uh, win for us, uh, as opposed to having to sort of manually go in and, you know, the system we have now, manually go in and try to fix things, documents, and things like that. Uh, now it's <coughs> now that, uh, that our software vendor SAP, who provides the software, you know, provides it out of the box. So uh, you know that's that's one one step forward for us. Uh, and then just partnering with departments, you know, we're we're getting much more proactive about partnering with agencies and departments and see how we can support, like we did with AHS and other departments, how we can support their diversity and inclusion recruitment initiatives. Um, you know, we, we have two. We have two other talent acquisition <coughs> specialists now, uh, which is unique uh, for the state. Previously, the, the job of the, uh, the this job was titled employment coordinator, where it was really just a transactional role, where they just got a list of candidates from the system and said they had some qualifications, and then forwarded it along to the to the hiring managers. Um, right now, now we have people who are actually working directly with hiring managers to strategize on how they can get better at recruitment, how they can do better. So. Um, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot more assets available to us, uh, you know, within recruitment to help hiring managers improve their recruiting. So we have found Derek Lopez. Yeah, mm -hmm. Derek is yes, immensely uh, helpful in a variety of ways. Yeah. So I have two thoughts that I don't know how or whether you want to incorporate, sure. but in terms of being able to increase just the uh, recruitment um, overall for state government. Um, Curtis and the partnership have a website that actually is um, very, very helpful uh, for recruitment purposes, and you're probably more than happy to share the, um, the link, or, but you can also talk about it. And, and we this year updated a document that is, is part of our on-the-job training manual for women and people of color to go into highway construction, but it's also a standalone document is called Hiring and Retaining a Diverse Workforce, mm -hmm. and it includes a lot of live links and updated links and suggestions about social media and all of those different things, yeah. which I know that you're already doing a lot of that, but every little bit helps probably. Well, we can, we're doing it in a broad sense. We need to do a little bit better about being more intentional, I think more specific. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to that's, share that's, my that's, link, and yeah. you want to talk a little bit, Curtis, about Sure. The work um, you're doing. Before that, I'm going to plug in for state police. Yeah. Uh, if you've not spent time with them and their, their uh, restructured recruiting function, you should go and talk with them. I think the last couple of classes of troopers, um, they've had like up to 15% of their new recruits have been. Persons of color only. Mm -hmm. Can we them. invite someone to come here? Sure, if you speak cook or um, Gary Scott. I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, Gary Scott. Yeah, Gary Scott. Uh, or Ingrid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is the result. Their numbers are a result of about six years worth of work. Uh, strategic work in positioning the state police in markets where they're largely uh, folks of color. Right? Um, so, you know, you got good stuff happening in the state government. That's one of the places that it's really happening. Uh, the other is uh, we have a, uh, a website that we're building out right now, but it's I am in Vermonter.org. And if you're online, you can go to it right now. I am in Vermonter.org. Yeah. And it's a unique resource for um, 
persons of color that are considering relocating to Vermont for work, school, or uh, retirement. We have two of the five regions built out so far. Um, and it's uh, a, a list of, not a list, but a, a profiles of Vermonters of color uh, who talk about Vermont in their own words, unedited, um, and why Vermont is their home, why they call Vermont home. And the, um, with the good, the bad, the ugly, but ultimately, what everyone comes back to is quality of life. Um, we have sections on culture, kind of multicultural Vermont from a, uh, an artistic standpoint, performing arts, visual arts, um, recreation in terms of who comes to Vermont and who's already in Vermont in terms of you know, our association with the National Brotherhood of Skiers or Outdoor Afro or um, you know, black cyclists, black motorcyclists. Um, to let people know that there's in fact, there are in fact people already here right. that are fully engaged. Um, you know, you can go to Barry to see the Michael Jackson review band, you know, if that's your, if that's your thing. <laughs> um, or you can go down to Jag and Woodstock to see black uh, playwrights uh, show their works. Um, so, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you're, we'll, 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 anyway, so anyway, that, that, that's going to be Are you online there? Yeah, yeah, I've got it right here. Beautiful. It looks good. Yeah. Great, okay. Um, so we need, we need about $45,000 to finish building out the site. What you see there is a prototype with um, Champlain Valley and southeastern Vermont. Um, we'd like to be able to complete the entire project. Um, within a year from now, um, and uh, then we would make it a closed subscription site um, so that employers that are committed to, and one of the things we, we would do would be to sort of certify for the, for the world that, yeah, these are employees, employers that are really focused on uh, inclusion and equity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is one way that they can demonstrate that to candidates that are coming in, rather than having the deer in the headlight look of a person of color asking, well, what's it like for my family here? <clears throat> and that's where, at least in the private sector where we do work, um, a lot of people decide not to come here based on the reaction that the interview community or the HR director has when asked the question, what, so we've talked a great deal about the job, my qualifications match what your needs are, um, but once the conversation is off topic in terms of, well, what's like my family here? And you choke on the question, they say, well, you're not ready for me. So, Take a job someplace else. Yeah. So this site was designed. That's awesome. Because I was recruiting for another company, and most of the people I was recruiting for <coughs> here in Vermont, before I was here, most of the people I was recruiting for were from out of state, and that was the biggest thing is they needed to, they wanted to be connected to a community. If they're going to be bringing their family and yeah. you know, by themselves yeah. coming here, mm -hmm. the connection to the community, their community is mm -hmm. is paramount to them. With that decision whether to come or not. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you said. You can't make it the case that. Yeah. But there's, there's, I think there's more too. I mean, I am that person. I'm that story. I can't, I've been here for 10 years now, and I came here to take a job with National Life Group. And I lasted nine months with National Life Group. And, um, but I, I'm a, you know, an anomaly because I, I chose to stay here anyway. Right. Um, but the question is, is not what gets you here, it's what keeps you here. Right. Um, so I want to, you know, politely kind of push back a little bit on the Curtis. Um, but, but support you, um, but because I think, in good conscience, I, I have a hard time asking somebody to come here if 
if I don't think the conditions are right or suitable for them to really sustain here. I, I think, you know, not to sound pretentious, but I'm a little bit of an anomaly uh, to have stayed here for 10 years, eight more years than I've ever been any place else in my life. Um, but uh, the, the conditions on the ground right here are, um, they're tenuous. Uh, for people of color in this state, and we got to be really transparent about that, and we got to do the work to fix it uh, so we can keep people here, not just get them here. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I've only been here for 40 years. Yeah. Oh, it's all? <laughs> I've only been here for, for, for You're still not a Vermonter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, there's a, you know, as with all, Vermonters rely on the spectrum. And my advice to people is if you want to be a couch potato, mm -hmm. this is not the place to be. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. If you know you want easy access to the mall, <laughs> if, if you want grub hub, if you want then this is not this is not Cracker <laughs> Barrel. <laughs> uh, but that the uh, And yes, if, if there's a folks of color in the state of Vermont share the same challenges as folks of color everywhere. My pitch, though, is 15% of the population, wherever you go in the world, and I've traveled all over the world, lived all over the world, 15% of the population are knuckleheads. Only 15. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you're being generous. <laughs> well, you know, I can think of a couple of countries where it ends up to about 25. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the question one has to ask oneself is, where are the other 85% doing? And if you can demonstrate that our form of government, in terms of civic engagement, in terms of town meeting, in terms of access to uh, policy makers, uh, access to those decision makers that affect everything from you know, the tree warden to your school board select board, then this is the place to be. Because you're not going to find that very in, true. Yeah, mm -hmm. very true. any place else. So if you want to live on a human scale, this is the this is this is the place, um, but it has to be balanced with, um, you know, maybe having <coughs> to get in the car and drive to Rutland from Brattleboro to see Stomp, or the Barry Opera House to see the Michael Jackson Review Band, right. or Fences at, at the Flynn, um, or you know. So that there's um, there's a uh, we we just had in Brattleboro, um, Chris McBride, you know, who's like a Grammy Grammy winning bassist. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of things to do here, right? and that's what's kept me here. Um, it's very and, positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very positive. Mm -hmm. It is. We can train your HR departments in how to make a pitch. <clears throat> yeah, I think the, the challenge is it's not traditionally the HR department that has the, the frontline experience with interviewing and hiring. Um, to Bill's point, we're taking a more active role in supporting hiring managers, but it's, it's the actual supervisors that are typically engaging in those conversations in the interview. So it kind of broadens the audience a little bit. For, right. yeah. Who are the people that we should be training to make yeah. it a reality? Yeah. Yeah. So we've done it with state police, and, and they have an incredible track record over the last mm -hmm. five or six years. Which is interesting because they're struggling with recruitment in general. Right. Yeah. For state police. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the yes. fact that they've had the success recruiting minority populations is actually very interesting yeah. mm -hmm. in light of the overall market for their mm -hmm. recruitment. But, but to what end, though, I guess, is, is, uh, and I, this, is, this is a place where I, I work it on a daily basis. So I've I got to chime in. I've got to get out of here. Get back up the road, but I've got to chime in on this. The question is, is to what end 
Why are we recruiting uh, black and brown police officers? To reflect the community, I would think. Hopefully so I can get my incarceration rates down, okay? So hopefully, hopefully so I can get my, my arrest rates down as well because it's, if they're reflective of the community, then that means their, their actions are gonna be reflective in a, in a manner as such correct. as that the disparities are going to reduce, correct? Correct. So that's where we start counting success. And so we still got some counting to do. Understood. <clears throat> Can, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I know that we're getting close to the end of the time, and um, we do have other on the list. And I do want to. I do want to um, talk about something um, before people get out of here. I don't know what is the history of this council in terms of supporting legislation when it is like proposed legislation. Mm -hmm. But I would really, I, I because you council. I my guess is you're an advisory council. To the commissioner, is that correct? It's an advisory council mm -hmm. to, to the, the commissioner and to the secretary of administration. Right, mm -hmm. so sometimes there's mm -hmm. legislation, mm -hmm. and I anticipate that there will be some. It would be really nice to have this board or this council advise or provide, a, a really take a position on some of those pieces of legislation. And so uh, my hope and goal here today was really to see if you have any willingness to do that in 2019. Um, when there is pending legislation, whether this council can take a position on it and advise the commissioner or Secretary Young or the agency of administration to take a position about some of those. That is a novel suggestion that I'm going to turn to Diane because I think she and I um, started around the same time on the council, like around 2002-ish. And to the best of my knowledge, we have never taken a position on any legislation, um, but I'm not sure why not, or that there would be any problem with doing so. What do you think? I think we could certainly take a position, and we could certainly advocate with the commissioner and the secretary of administration. I, th I don't know. I think this is something for Tom. Uh, or Rachel in terms of, you know, you can go as a citizen to the legislature and testify on anything, anytime, regardless of your state employment. Um, but I'm not sure that the chair of this council could go to the legislature and testify. Um, right, and not so, I, I'm not really necessarily asking that anybody do that. Okay. So much that, uh, more so that if you took a position on a piece of legislation, you could advise the people that have that you're supposed to advise, which is the commissioner, Absolutely. on that legislation, and, and then we could the develop uh, or at least discuss it um, in wow. our meetings and work on that. And I think what you're suggesting would be maybe a fourth subcommittee. That that's what it sounds like. Maybe no. <laughs> um, I'm thinking that because, and we know that legislation comes up really fairly quickly, right? Yeah. So yes. if there's legislation at the, you know, January, February, or there's a bill that there's proposed, and it directly involves equity, diversity, inclusion, state government, or whatever, the people that will be testifying there will be the HRC, the commissioner, Tom, other people. It would be nice, I think, because one of the questions is, what does this council's job is to counsel the commissioner and give advice to the commissioner? The question is, do can we take positions? Can we take a position on a piece of bill and advise the commissioner to take that position on that bill? Mm -hmm. I like that. First, on women, you do that, don't you? Uh, no, no, see, we, we are not, not we have allowed a to do special, <laughs> unique to us part of our, our statute that doesn't allow us to, that puts restrictions on us. But I think, um, you get that by design. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, they, yeah. they we'll don't talk later. Mm -hmm. talk later. We'll talk later. It seems to me the litmus test yeah. might be whether it is aligning with the governor's priority or not, and, and does that put us in, I mean, do we serve at the at the pleasure of the governor on this council, or? Oh, but I some think of us could advise and well, influence we do. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that's all, yeah. all yeah. I think that's right. all we're, that's, that's right. all I'm saying, mm -hmm. could you advise the governor yeah. or the commissioner to take a certain position, and all you, it's not that they have to, have to take your, take your advice. But it would be great if the, the council 
voted or agreed that we, when we look at this bill, we think this is a good idea. And we would like DHR or the commissioner or the governor to, to support it or be against it. Because I think that that would be a really useful thing for this council to do. Yeah, I think I'd like to see that happen. Where you hung up is whether it's public, you know, you're taking a public position as a committee, that might get into a slippery slope versus advising the, the powers that be feels absolutely like right. a fair. Well, I don't know what goes into the report, which I think is the only public piece, right? Although we're being recorded today. I don't know. <laughs> what is public or not but I guess I think everything that we do is public right? yeah. okay yeah. and I think so we have two reports per year and the first one is due in mid-January and it's basically our accomplishments and our goal setting for the next season and then in April we submit an updated kind of EEO plan for state government in general mm -hmm. um, and both of those documents, I believe, are on the website. The website isn't real updated. I think it's still got some 2017 stuff, including the roster. But pretty much um, our meetings are all open meetings. We are now being recorded. And I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, we're going to be recorded moving forward in 2019, maybe. I thought if, that was. If you request it, it will happen. <laughs> oh, we didn't I, request I, I requested all the You requested, meetings. okay. Yeah. I, I know yeah. Chris Green personally, so yeah. we, you probably, we probably will be recorded unless there's some, some you know, serious objection to the, to the group. Doesn't seem to have had a chilling effect on our conversation no. today. <laughs> no, it doesn't, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm all for transparency, and I think that we are uh, part of. This is part of the democratic process. So I don't think like we're going to have some closed door discussions. I do think that there is a question about, you know, we are serving at the, most of us, at least at the will of the governor, because he's the one who appointed us or continues to sign our paperwork. There's a couple of agencies and departments, including Carrie, yours, um, and Department of Labor, that, and you, Diane that are automatically on the council no matter what, but um, the rest of us, I think, are serving at the pleasure and will of the governor. So, I, so the, the entire council exists at the will That's of the true. governor. That's right. um, But I, I think uh, I like the idea of us, as part of our advisory process, yeah. saying we think this legislation is good or we think it's bad or you know, offering input. Uh, it could possibly get a little sticky if there's something that we're really opposed to that the governor is really in favor of. Mm -hmm. And so then we, I think we talk about how do we, how do we proceed in that, that case, or maybe it's just presented as advice and not as this is our position and we're going to issue a press release and we're going to take a big stand, you know, but right. here's our input. Right. Uh, I agree, Karen, with you. And I think the, tr the trans, it's just about being transparent. You yeah. know, we can advise the governor and he could just say, thanks a lot, but I'm going to do this because it's yeah. his prerogative. He's the freaking governor, right? So, I mean, <laughs> so that's, I mean, I think it's, it's okay to, to, to have the public see that as a governor, I'm receiving advice, but I chose to do otherwise. And I've seen often where a leader turned out to be right in instances like that, you know, against uh, better advice. So transparency is always good. I have a Those of us who work for state government right. work for the governor, and so right. pretty much have to support the positions of the governor. Right. It's right. much more important at the commissioner level, but all of us do. Mm -hmm. right. There's an elaborate process or a comprehensive process mm -hmm. um, within state government to review yeah. bills and so do bill state. review forms, and sure. right. you know it goes up the chain, and mm. there's positions taken by the administration ultimately based on fee input feedback from departments. So that's not such a good idea. Well, it's not such a good idea then, <laughs> Well, I don't know. So I, I think that it is a good idea for our council to at least be made aware of um, bills as they're yeah. proposed and pending, and for us to be discussing it. And sure. I, I think that there is an opportunity for us to weigh in. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's any one of us individually taking a particular position as much as we as your council are recommending the following position on this pending bill. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think honestly, if you ask the commissioner of DHR and the governor, would you be interested in our input? 
you know, yeah. on this bill, they would probably both say yes. Yeah. So yeah. I don't yeah. know why yeah. they would yeah. say no. So I don't want to hear what the GWDC thinks right. about this bill that affects yeah. diversity. Well, I exactly. can't imagine it's either the one. The charge is the charge of the right. council to do that to right. advise. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. So. Yep. So, Gordon, do you have any particular pieces of legislation in mind that you think are coming down the pike, or? Um, I, I cannot say yet. Okay. But I do believe that there is some coming up that I think would be definitely um, um, in the realm of being more equity and diversity focused and fair, mm -hmm. um, particularly to persons of color. And so, certainly, I think that I would really love to see this council give the advice that would be in support of those bills. But, and when we know what the language is and what the bill is, then I would certainly come here and share that with you so that we could discuss it and share whether we want to advise. Mm -hmm. I think that that sounds great. I think logistically, because as somebody said, um, the bills come fast and furious right. and the activities, and our council, at least last year's schedule, was meeting quarterly and then having subcommittees meeting more frequently. That's why I had thought that maybe we were talking about a new subcommittee, but it sounds like not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think that if there's a way for council members to just keep each other and the rest of us all in the loop as things like just send a link to a bill if you become aware of it and say this, um, I think this might be of interest to the council. Yeah. And Great. we can see how soon thereafter we're gonna be having a council meeting or whether we need to communicate just the uh, emails and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I would just ask that people be really careful and discreet about anything that we're putting in writing and committing to right. um, because we don't wanna cause anybody any embarrassment. Including ourselves. Yeah, I, I know there there will be probably four or five coming from us uh, alone uh, to include the constitutional amendment. So there's uh, there's going to be a lot of activity. That's great. That's great to hear. So <clears throat> so are there other others <laughs> um, as far as things that we haven't yet identified or talked about for? things that we want to tackle in 2019? I just wonder if we want to revisit quarterly meetings. Mm -hmm. It just feels like there's a whole lot going on. And So I think that we're <clears throat> now segueing into our like uh, yeah. business portion of the meeting, which is all of the things that we usually discuss. How often we want to meet, where we are going to meet, where and when, how often, and then also uh, electing chairs or co-chairs or whatever. So I agree with you, Diane, that um, for me, quarterly meetings is too far apart for us to meet as a group and we lose a certain amount of continuity. And particularly if we don't, I think the whole premise was that it would make it easier for, because we were lacking consistency and, having everybody attending the meetings when we were holding them more often. But we lack the consistency even if we only hold them quarterly. So I would want us to consider maybe going back to every other month. But I think what every other month and maybe skipping the summer. Yep. So we do five <laughs> meetings five meetings a year. I think that that would make sense. And then there's nothing to say that the subcommittees can decide when and on what meeting schedule they want to meet, and some of that may be driven by some of the focus of their activity at certain times of the year. Well, you could say that the subcommittees could meet, meet on the, on the off opposite. Month, the off month. Yeah. So, do we put that to vote? I, I'm saying do we put it to vote in, but I'm recognizing that technically. I think we only have one, two, three, four, five of us, six of us that are actually voting members at the table, but I think that's still a quorum, maybe, possibly. <laughs> I don't know what our, how many total members we have right now. I think um, who we're missing at today's meeting, so Dana, who just wrote to us, and said she was sorry she couldn't come. We're missing Ruben mm -hmm. Jennings. And 
actually. Now I'm forgetting somebody. <coughs> Who? Aditi? Well, oh, no, she she's actually ad hoc. Oh, Casey. Oh, Casey, thank you. Casey's from the AG's office. So if we're only missing three, then maybe six is a quorum. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. I said with great confidence. Um, so, should we go ahead and vote on the? Is there any discussion on the frequency of the meetings, pros, cons? What do you think? I think every other month is great. I'm just trying to think about when, the when? which months that would be, and if we skip the summer. So, if we um, certainly leave out July and August. We, we could do we could do February, April, and June, and then we could do September and November. And possibly have still an annual retreat in December. Is that too many? Sure, let's give that a try. I like it. February, April, June. November. September and November, and then maybe a retreat in December. Okay. Um, okay. And um, what, let's just go, if we can, like pick a date and days and times right now, that'd be great. Can we do that? And then we can just yeah. well, we vote on a Mondays whole yearly four. schedule. We had been doing Mondays, well, we were alternating Mondays and Tuesdays. That was part of the problem for you, Joe. Right. right, Mondays are my only bad day, really. Yeah, so I think that we were doing Tuesdays. half the times we were meeting was good for you. Yeah. The other half wasn't. <laughs> but um, is there a particular day? First of all, does CAPS work for people or are there groups or folks that want to advocate for alternating with Waterbury? Or I think right okay. now we happen to have the majority of members that are located here in Montpelier, but I know that doesn't help you guys. Oh, but it's, it's a fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure, sure. I know that CAPS works in terms of usually for um, availability of meeting space and parking. Yeah. Parking was tough today. Yeah. Was I know. It depends on who's in here for training. Yeah. So. That's right. Tuesdays and Thursdays are SSG, so those are okay. big days for yeah. CAPS oh. for training. Right. There's another activity happening this morning, too. So women's something. Carrie, you should probably know. Yeah, that. meeting about the centennial. 2020, the centennial of women's suffrage. Yeah, they didn't yep. end until 12. <coughs> well. This is Wednesday a better day. Is that a regular regular Tuesday, Thursday for supervising state government? Is that a regular? At least through this month. I don't, have, I don't know what their schedule is. I think it like changes because I'm about to yeah. take it and it's Wednesdays. Uh, yeah. Oh, so. Well, so, right. so. Okay. Right. I, but I don't think we should choose our day around right. caps parking. I think we should do it based on. <laughs> okay. you know, There's other parking. Yeah. There is other yeah. parking. There's parking over there, too. Yeah. And, uh, so Tuesdays, 2 to 4, just for the sake of consistency and frequency cool. like first Tuesday second Tuesday yeah Tuesday. yeah so think? third Tuesday doesn't work for me because I got a classification committee but the other three Tuesdays I can do P- does Tuesday afternoon work for most of us mm-hmm. and two to four works mm-hmm. so did we want to go with maybe the fourth Tuesday of the month or the or the first or second I just realized we're not meeting until February, so maybe yeah. the first The Tuesday? first tends to be bad because so much stuff happens at the beginning of the month. The second Tuesday of the month, <laughs> going once, going twice. Second Tuesday, two to four, caps be there, be square. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, okay. I'll reserve the rooms and send out the invites, and if I notice that we don't have many people coming, we can always try to find another alternate day. Okay. 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 Second Tuesday, thank you. Of February, April, June, September. I like Tuesdays better. Besides the fact that we don't have to worry about losing Joe, is that frequently we've got holidays on Mondays. Yeah. Or if not frequently, that's sometimes. So. so, do we need to vote eyes and stuff, or like? Okay. No, I think we All against. Exactly. Nobody. <laughs> Great. All right. So, and we're going to continue with the same committee structure, so that's going to yep. work. And yep. those committee groups will be deciding their, their scheduling and their 
and within the next month, um, we should have an updated website with all of our information awesome. and our minutes, and oh, I'll post agendas there when I can, so I just have to be trained on how not to ruin the website first. <laughs> <laughs> Which is necessary yeah, yeah. for me. <laughs> just pictures of my dog. <laughs> I go, yes. Excellent. Uh, so hopefully that will help, too, with providing information to other people who want to come, too. So. So now comes the favoritest part of the meeting for everybody, um, and it's the election of, co first it's the nomination yeah. of co-chairs, and then it's the campaign speeches, and, <laughs> the, speeches. Wheeling and, dealing. and the passing out of candy, and the kissing right. of babies. <laughs> and, then, and then the actual election by Australian ballot. Now, so, <laughs> See you later. so I always, like to, from my own perspective, throw it open to folks who haven't previously um, had a chance or exercise. I nominate Mark. Thank you, Mark. Very, very, very welcome. Uh, your presence and participation was extremely welcome today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm <coughs> guessing also that are we limited to the yeah. chairs have to be members of the council? So. Yeah. Oh, um, those and crazy rules. And I think we've like lost another quorum. voting member. Yeah, so. just lost a couple. Oh. Yeah. There goes the quorum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is there a reason? I guess what I'd be interested Diane. in hearing is if the Oh, current... Diane ran away? Did she leave or did she just leave? Well, Diane stepped out. So, yes. I think, left. Left. I think left. she's gone, yeah. Then we better vote fast. So, so who's left who can be board? So we've got I Karen, can't. and we've got Carrie, and there's me, Joel. and we've got Joe. We've got not, you're not a member. I'm not. Oh no. So Rachel, and I don't know. I was on the commissioners. I'm sure that. <laughs> I'd have to look at the, I brought the executive well, order. <laughs> I don't think, I, I think we would want it to be a broader audience anyway, yeah. but I, I'd be interested, is there any reason that our co-chairs don't want to continue or? <laughs> I would be perfectly willing to continue. Um, I, it's really challenging for me to find the time to do mm -hmm. it. Just honestly, I don't feel like I've been the greatest co-chair. Thank you so much Thanks, for it. Thank you, Laura. I, I wonder if, if uh, we put out an email to everybody saying, Is that asking for interested? nominations, yeah, yeah and then voted we'll our next meeting. Yeah, I think yeah. Oh, we do. can easily yeah. do that. That yeah. makes total sense. If you're comfortable, Rachel, with sure. having, I mean, it's not like, we'll ditch you between now and then. We'll <laughs> continue. I don't know. There are usually, rarely are there co-chair emergencies. Like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> the bad, the bad sign of just, the sky. Like, just get put a message them. that says, if this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I like that maybe, I don't know if you're planning to create notes, uh, meeting minutes, whatever, yes, um, and share it with the whole committee. Mm -hmm. And that way we can have it as an agenda item um, for the February sure. meeting to yeah. Have uh, have an election. Yeah. Do we um, want written nominations in the meantime, or? I was just going to ask the same question. We should be soliciting nominations from. I mean, we could have them kind of sure. ready to go. I think yeah. that would probably help. Yeah. 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 All right. I mean, I'm also curious for those members who are here, Joe, um, and Karen, <laughs> uh, whether either one of you is eager or interested. In Not particularly. <laughs> I don't know, Bernie. Does that mean? Happy as sort of a civic, you know, contribution, but I, I'm thrilled with the leadership we have. And, oh, you know. Well, thanks. Um, did you already serve once, or no? Nothing. No, I'm, pretty, I'm still kind of a newbie, so that's okay. yeah. Um, two years in. Okay. But you also sit on this council representing a population. It's important to remember as we're. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously, it's keep... something that can be pushed a little bit to the side if the focus is strictly on racial diversity. Right. So it's important, I think, Joe, that you are on this committee to right. represent. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that. I absolutely am thrilled and continue to yeah. want it's to. Important. It's an important yes. voice to have yes. at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. For sure. Agreed. 
Okay. So what else do we have? We've run out of I think we may action be steps. done, actually. Action steps. I no think action. we identified the things that we're going to be doing in 2019, so we have that information, and we set a meeting schedule, and we made a decision about the chair election process. And it all happened before 4 o'clock. Yeah, pretty Brilliant. good. <laughs> yeah. And now, Brilliant. circle this day. <laughs> Drive home well, in the daylight. <laughs> Well, thank you all Thanks, everybody. for coming and participating, and um, I'm looking forward to the council doing all kinds of good things in 2019. This feels like an important year coming up. I think with everything yeah. going on, yeah. with the yeah. new person coming on board, I think it's yeah. an important year. Yeah. It's committed. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Me too. All right. Thank and you all. Thank so, you all. Curtis, you're the one who I think gets the award for coming from the furthest away. Yes. 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 Yeah, so take some snacks on your way home. <laughs> Survival. Uh, I'll just shoot. Our estimate is 50 people, people and there's a lot of people. <laughs> okay. sure. I think you did good though.